Well, we've been talking about doing this for a while. Well, this stream we've talked about doing for a while, but a little uh, behind the curtain. There's not really a curtain, but uh, years ago, uh, for a while, we were talking about doing a thing on our own anyway. Like this, this group here, uh, I think Mike and I maybe talked about it a little bit on a previous stream. Uh, Fire Escape was planned, and uh, here we are. Uh, we all work Good in different choice. places, and yet here's a, here's a version of that right here in 2020, by God. Yeah, uh, we, we talked about it when I was in Stanford. We mentioned that there was a third person we had in mind, but we didn't say it. I think people probably put the, the puzzle pieces together. Um, but, yeah, this is kind of a long time. I mean, this grouping is a long time in the making. Not that we haven't been on stuff before. Um, well, I think I've, I've worked with both of you a lot, but at separate times. That's the thing. Mainly we've Mary, but then worked Dan. in the same orbit, but like rarely have us three. Like we've all been really good friends for a long time, but it's been just the occasional thing. Like Mary, you and I did that thing with Danny on that St. Patrick's Day. Uh, Mike, yeah. you and I, you know, had more opportunities uh, at Giant Bomb and everything, but not really a game informer. So we really haven't been able to be like on cam or on podcast together much. Yeah, and I mean, when I started at Gamespot, Mary was there for another three, three years. Was it that long? Yeah, I don't remember if I pinpoint it, but I do know that uh, you and I bonded over the Dark Souls 3 event. So I can probably oh, right. base it off of whatever year that game came out. Because oh. that was our very first event that we had together, where we ate meat with our hands. <laughs> that, yeah, that Never was... Uh, I hear people like Andy McNamara or like Gersman talking about these crazy preview events they went to back in the day where like they flew them in helicopters into Hawaii for Call of Duty and stuff like that. And I got, like, one small taste of that, which is my second week at GameSpot. And Mary and I went up to Napa, this castle, essentially. The dude, the architect, or this big, like, vintner financier had made this replica of his castle that he grew up in in Italy. And he made it. It's still up in Napa. You can go. But we were in the cellar, and they were, like, purposely not giving us utensils Good to choice. make it a more medieval, authentic experience. Even though the game is, like gothic fantasy medieval uh and then there were sword fighting lessons it was a very bizarre but memorable event it sounds like uh, it sounds like the castle from die another day where like madonna's learning how to fence <laughs> that's super weird i just watched that uh movie really? but i've yeah they put most of the they put a few of the pierce brosnan they put tomorrow never dies and world is not enough on uh netflix recently ah nice so i've been watching all those well, I guess all yeah. three of us now out from under the CBS umbrella just in time to not be snatched up in the claws of Red Ventures or whatever. Yeah, right? that was crazy to see. I'm I'm interested to see where that goes. But I mean, I remember because this is not the first acquisition we've been through. So we've been through that ringer before and we know what it's like. Um, I was at you were there. I was at GameSpot when we were on the third floor and we moved down to the first floor. And that was like a huge undertaking. And so I was wondering if they're going to have to move again, because in the San Francisco building, that's a CBS owned building. Yeah. And same with New York, I think. Well, yeah, I, they, I believe so. They've got the logo on the outside. I know it's only like, you know, the one or two floors of the building, but I think it was a CBS interactive building. I, th I think I, it is. But I think CBS proper owns it, though. So I imagine, I mean, this might, I don't know this for a fact, but I would we'll imagine it as a fact. Let's, let's make sure we're saying everything is facts here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as someone who was involved with the purchase, I know for a fact that they have to move buildings. So it'll be interesting to see what happens after, you know, quarantine ends, whenever that happens to be. Because I know they're all giant bomb. GameSpot is all remote, as most of the world is right now. Yeah, likewise. Uh, Mary, are you at home? Like yeah, I've home? been at home, actually. So when I moved to Twitch... I was working in the San Francisco office, but I would say, was it two and a half years ago, I switched teams and moved to Portland, Oregon. And there's no office here in Portland. I work in my office. So I'm in home and I've been working home from home for over two years. So I've actually, it's interesting because I grew accustomed to working from home and going through the sadness of being isolated two years ago and now everybody else is going through it and I'm watching it and remembering what it was like to be alone. You do get used to it, but you also do like talk to the birds outside of your window more. Well, Mike's got cats. Somewhere. That two of them. No. Chat will tell you otherwise that there's only one, but I stand by the fact that there are two. Are you, are you getting that on uh, Mike's mic as well, Mary? 
Yeah, yeah that's it. his. That's definitely internet connection. Yeah. That happens to us when we play. Um, uh, when we like play Resident Evil or Dead Space, sometimes that can happen just with a, oh, okay. a connection on he's, Discord. He's messing with something. How is the air quality situation in Portland? Oh my God, it's so much better. I really? think it was two weeks ago, our air quality index was like over 400, which made it the worst in the world. And we couldn't go outside, but luckily, I wanna say, this is again, this is just serendipitous. Six months ago, I needed a new fan and I was feeling real extra. So I got a fan that cleaned the air and I got like the nicest one I could get because I thought, meh, I hate pollen, I'll just get it. And it's probably saved my ass because it, I just kept it right next to me and it circulated all the air in the, in the house. I live in the upstairs of a house. Um, and so we were completely fine as long as we stayed inside. I think the saddest thing was that I couldn't walk Simone oh. and he definitely didn't like it. And then he kept me up all night because he never got any of his like energy out. And so like, imagine just never walking your dog for four days. He was like, he was going crazy and I felt really bad because you can't explain to a pup why he's not allowed to go for a walk. No, no. Jeez. So what do most people do in that situation that have pets? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people did like, take, you know, you got to take them out to go pee and stuff. So they went out, but like they would rush them back in as soon as possible. And just nobody went on. There were no walks for anyone for about one, I would say one solid week. And then, and then it rained and all of it went away. So it's a long time, but it's also, a, if it's a manageable time, I didn't crack. I didn't like lose my mind. I would say on day seven, I was like, I really want to go outside. And then it rained and now it's fine. I've been going out as much as I can right now because the air is incredible. It's like sad, but the bar is so low that now that I have breathable air, I'm like, I, morale is high. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm this, my, my attitude is great, you know? Colors are brighter and I'm feeling good is because I can go outside and breathe. It's like just- A luxury just to be able to breathe clean air now? luxury you know like that's all it is now but uh yeah Simon's been going on lots of walks we don't have a treadmill <laughs> so that hoot nanny we don't have a treadmill but um imagine Simon on a treadmill he'd be like miserable he'd be like I hate this yeah. he uh, he'd probably pee on it instantly um he's been going on all sorts of walks so he's he's much happier now so everything's back to normal um it just was a weird week man <laughs> Relative normal, I guess, in 2020. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing, right? <laughs> yeah, Mike, how's uh, how's Hoboken going? Uh, how am I sounding? Sounding better? Yes. You sound good. Much cool. Better. It might do that every once in a while. My internet's been fucked since the hurricane came through, and I still have not gotten Verizon to come. So we'll figure it out. Um, it's been good. We were there was a pretty high number of cases here. So there's 50,000 people in Hoboken. And it's a square mile, so it's kind of a worrisome thing from the start, but we've been pretty good. Um, I've been getting out, and, like, I have a, several friends that, you know, when we can safely hang out on, like, a rooftop or something, we uh, will hang out. But what's happening? <laughs> what's wise chat? What's going on? Nothing. They just, they like your story, I think. Are you, like, are you playing, like, a, like a fart noise? What? Is, Mar is Mario coming or something? What are you talking about, Mike? <laughs> do you, you don't hear this, do you, Mary? No, chat gave it away though. Dan is not smooth. Chat give chat tells all. They have no poker face. <laughs> I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for chat. <laughs> for those meddling chatters. <laughs> yes. Um, Mike, that's gross. Yeah. <laughs> now I know I can fart with reckless abandon. I can't wait till you get into a, a real serious talk about fucking Crusader Kings or whatever you're into. Uh, right believe it or not, it, that might or might not be on my list. Um, oh my god. Dan, like, put all this effort into this incredible tech setup, invited his buddies over to have a serious discussion, only to have fart noises and coming noises over top of Mike There's every no time he has something noises. important. There's no coming yeah, noises. Not I just according to chat, that. unless they're the same. Not on the I stream, have, I've had the Mario screaming. Look, I... I I have a rare form of tinnitus where I don't hear a ringing. It's just always orgasm <laughs> noises. It makes things very intense no matter where. I went to a funeral the other day, and it was very sexy. Oh, yeah? No, I didn't go to a funeral. Uh, well, well, but anyway. Yeah. McGruber had the, uh, the cemetery uh, keep, sexy thing. Keep putting fart day. noises over my monologues, and there will be a funeral. Oh. <laughs> That's a threat. <laughs> uh, just kidding. 
I always I always enjoy see, hearing Dan like um, he's like okay it's gonna be the fart noises don't really fit thematically for the stream tonight so I'm gonna dial them <laughs> down. There's gonna be some new tricks. Uh, and I was like, Dan, you'll revert to the fart noises by tomorrow. Like, let's. Well, no, no. I see the uh, the chat is asking about the sound alerts, and in fact, Doctor Ryan, the fart doctor, who is a prolific uh, fart sound alert purveyor, uh, he is asking about it right now. But hey, this is a, this is serious game conversation between friends. Uh, I will not be uh, soliciting farts uh, tonight. Uh, so yeah, it's it's very very serious talk. No room for farts. Yeah, do we want to get into structural stuff? Yeah, um, that's uh, literally the only reason uh, you're invited is because I... Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's go over the rules. Yeah, yeah. Stream mom and stream dad have joint host. custody of me today, and they invited yeah. me to moderate a dispute. Um, yes. Despite my my turn for about a year as a uh, more of a supporting character on the Beast cast, most of my podcasting experience was hosting it. So we figured maybe I would host tonight, despite it being on Dan's stream. Um I'm going to be talking about my top five games, too. But, yeah, we figured consoles are coming out in, what, like a month? A little more than a month? Wow. Month-ish. Yeah, it was um, like five weeks or something. We had originally planned on doing this in, like, July, halfway through the year. But halfway through the year. things, as is often happening during 2020, kind of got pushed around. But we figured now with the consoles on the close horizon, we would uh, kind of take stock of the year. And the generation, but more of the year. We're going to talk about, uh, we each have like five games picked out that we all want to talk about. It's not like official, official ranking, because I think like Mary and we, Mary had mentioned it before we went live. It's like, I think we all know each other's taste pretty well. So I think we mm -hmm. kind of sidestepped some of the definites for like that Dan might have or I might have. But these are like generally our five favorite games so far in 2020. Mm. Yeah. And... We'll go around the horn one at a time, and then at the end, you know, we'll just kind of talk about the generation, whether it's our favorite game of the generation or the game that most represented the generation. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty largely just 2020 in review so far. Yeah, and we'll keep it loose, not a ton of structure or anything like that. But uh, do you, real quick before we, we launch into that, any big disappointments for you guys this year? <sighs> Yuck. Uh... Nothing that like stands out. Um, nothing that stands out personally. Like I don't think I. I don't think I was particularly looking forward to anything that I didn't end up liking. I think if anything, that might happen like in the latter part of the year. Like yeah. I'm not particularly looking for. And we, I don't want to get too future focused. I'm not particularly looking forward to s Cyberpunk as much as a lot of people. I'm excited for it as much as the average person. But, like, if Baldur's Gate 3 was not, like, the best thing ever, I, I think I'd probably be, I'll be a little bit disappointed. I have high expectations for that. Yeah, it's like a, they're going into early access, like, any day now. Um, oh, okay. Or whatever they're calling it. They do the thing where they release, like, a big chunk of the game, and then they just release the rest of it. Um, okay. I don't think I have any big surprise, or disappointments, I'm sorry, that stand out. I don't know about so you, So it's Mary. something that you expected to be good that was bad? It, like or just didn't quite like for example the ones i wrote down aren't, aren't bad by any means but i just wrote down yeah. doom eternal and uh resident evil 3 yeah. remake because i was really oh. excited for both of those and like they were both fine uh, but i actually never wound up beating doom eternal even though i was like right at the end and resident evil 3 remake just not at all did, did not live up to uh two but neither were bad games they were just kind of disappointing based on what i expected I'm sorry, uh, Resident Evil 3 actually would be my big, biggest disappointment. I, I, had a, I had fun playing it, um, and I, I was just really excited because, pe as people know, I, I kind of soured on the original Resident Evil 3 uh, after, watch after Mary and I replayed it, or Mary replayed it. So I had kind of low expectations for the remake, but I found the remake to be a bit boring coming off of Resident Evil 2 remake, which I thought was phenomenal. Uh, so I, yeah, Resident Evil, are there farts again? No. Oh, okay. Never mind. Never. I think they're just laughing at your argument. Uh, I don't think that. <laughs> I just think you weren't making your case very, very good. I was agreeing with you. What you have to say. <laughs> All right, Mary. Well, what you about just you? sound like a fool, is what we're saying. Uh, Mary, Mary, how about you? All right, hey, fart um, free zone. Fart free zone for for the rest of this. Uh, oh, oh, now that it's oh Mary's my turn. God, yeah, Dan, yeah. You liar. No, for you too, Mike. No farts. Okay. I never had high expectations for Marvel Adventures, but um, I have not enjoyed like that experience, and so I will not continue to play it. 
Um, but I didn't have high expectations, so it wasn't a disappointment. It just isn't the game that I would enjoy playing. Um, and let me think. This is personal, and I feel like it's going to get me in hot water. I think Animal Crossing is interesting, but it's just not for me. And I was really excited to play it, but it's just not my personal exciting game. Um, but it's not because the game is bad. The game is great. I think it's me. It's not It's not the game. It's me. Have you played previous ones or Harvest Stardew. Moon or anything or Stardew? No. So I fell in love with Stardew and I think I wanted it to be Stardew. But I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying I wanted it to be Stardew and it's not. And you know what? I can only play that game at like 6 p.m. on. And um, so I was always playing it at night. <laughs> that made me really sad. And I wanted stuff before I was allowed to have it. So I ended up cheating and doing that thing where you change the time right. in the game um, so that you could have trees and stuff. And then I just kind of, I got items so that I could have an outfit and then I wore my outfit and then I stopped playing it. And that was, that's my experience with Animal Crossing. That's yeah, it's very possible to like kind of break that experience for you. Like I didn't do the time warp thing, but I did the, the turnip market thing where I was constantly like, okay, finding people on Twitter or whatever that had like 600 bell turnips and then going there and making a bajillion dollars and like just speeding the game up faster than I should have probably. And that's probably why I dropped off quicker than maybe past Animal Crossings. So uh, I, I know what you mean for sure. Yeah. Not trying to hate on it. I'm just saying it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And I think I thought it was going to be Stardew. Stardew, we've had this conversation, Dan. Stardew, to me, like, was fundamentally, like, changed the way I perceived games where you grow, you do garden games. And I was so immersed in the world and befriending the villagers. It, it was just, it was, it, like, altered how I perceived those styles of games. And so I fell in love with it. And then this game just isn't that for me. Maybe it's because it doesn't have cave diving. I really like going into the caves and like killing monsters. That was the, like my favorite part. The like combat element of it? Yeah, it was fun. It had something for everybody, man. Yeah, I agree. And like I, I loved Animal Crossing, you know, from the beginning, but Stardew kind of clicked with me maybe even more than the most recent Animal Crossings before that. So yeah, Stardew clearly did some stuff uh, really special. Um, and yeah, for for as much as like Animal Crossing was this, I don't think I'm exaggerating by saying it was like a cultural phenomenon, like every celebrity ever was playing it. Yeah. I do feel like people stopped talking about it after like two months, despite assuming they would talk about it the whole year. But it was still, it, it wasn't, I wasn't really expecting much out of it. I didn't play much previous Animal Crossings and I played New Horizons for about three weeks before putting it down. I don't have any urge to go back. But yeah, I don't know. It came around at the exact right time because, like, that was the game that came out when the pandemic started. You know, like that was right around the same time when everyone's trying to buy switches and they're they're stuck inside their houses and stuff. So, I people would be talking about Animal Crossing in mass no matter what. But the fact that the pandemic was going on, I think, just like amplified it that much more. Yeah, and to be clear, I guess like two months is a pretty. Well, Nowadays, it's a long time to talk about a game, but Animal Crossing specifically, I kind of expected more just because it's built on the long tail. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's any arguing that it was like successful. But to be clear, um, I do have like a, the list of all the releases this year, or at least ones like, uh, if we don't touch on anything, we will go through honorable mentions and maybe something else that disappointed us and everything. Um, so we'll be talking about more than just these 15 games or however many we have. Definitely. I had games that I wish I could have put on because they're gray areas. They technically didn't come out in 2020, but they're in early access and they released like significant content updates in 2020. And so I wasn't sure how tight on these rules we were going to be. So I did not put them in my top five, but I will use them as honorable mentions because I think they're dope. They're just, they're like weird gray areas. That's nice. for sure. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, uh... Here, Mike, why don't you uh, go ahead? I just remembered I'm supposed to, uh, I need to bring some headphones out to Bonk in the other uh, room there. So I'm going to bring that okay. in. Do you want to start kicking off the, the host business there? Yeah, do you, uh, I'll wait till you're back to toss it to Mary. But yeah, again, I'm going to basically go around the horn. He probably activated the farts before he left the room, but if hopefully he didn't. Um, no. Oh, wait, yeah. actually, I, can, uh, I can do that now. Hang on. It's just one button. No. All right, here we go. Okay, I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> I'll just let Mike, the parts roll. The rules. What's, what's something I could... Uh, I'm going to recite... 
Uh, I could probably uh, find something a, good. A yeah, I could find a, a poem. You know what? Let's just do a classic. Let's do uh, Alfred. Poof, or, sorry, let's do Poof Rock. Let me find it. There we go. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Are the farts going, or should I should I start with this? Uh, there are no farts right. going. I, I. Damn it! All right. Fart well, fart. I have something. I have something for next time you do them. Um, oh. I mean, I can summon them anytime. No, you want. no, 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 no. That's all right. Okay. I can summon them anytime. <laughs> so, what kind of fucked up wizard are you? It, that's what I use my stream deck for. This is Mary. Mary, this is kind of our fault. We agreed to have it on Dan's channel, and give him the production power. Also, it's true. All of this is both of your faults because, like, this whole Twitch business. Because uh, Mike, me, you, and I think Tim and Vinny were uh, were playing. What was the we're playing uh, Call of Duty? No, we were Modern playing Warfare. The ver the, the, oh, Vermintide. Yeah, Vermintide. The big yeah, yeah. Hammer, oh, uh, ogres so or whatever. And uh, yeah. you were telling me you had started doing your banjo stuff, and you were talking about like just how great like the analytics are and everything, and how how fun it is. And then like immediately, I was reaching out to Mary. And asking her about it, uh, and and you set me up with like, okay, this this program and these extensions, this is something people do. So like, you two are the people most responsible for all this. Yeah, I'm we. I'm proud of it. I think it's <laughs> well, great makes, because makes you're, you've always been like, kind of a demon in the rough, and so being able to watch you come <laughs> that... out of your shell, yeah, a demon in the rough. Uh, that's that's you're able to like really showcase all of your talent and attributes um either you know for good or bad of humanity and i think that that's really what this site is all about it's not up to me to like decide what's morally righteous go out there and fart dan thank you i i think uh because i've seen people in chat say stuff like oh you know dan's finally like unchained and doesn't have anyone to answer to but it's like ultimately like giant bomb let me get away with so much stuff, so much total nonsense. So it's not like they were holding me back. I think I probably just didn't go as hard with obnoxious stuff at Giant Bomb because, like, out of, uh, you know, I had other people I was working with, and it's like I can't just be blaring fart noises for 20 minutes during a quick look. But, hey, if it's just me in a room, I can just fill it up with farts any night of the week. Yeah, this is Rikert.com, and this is your time to shine. So if you want it to look a certain way, so be it. And this is the look that you've chosen, Dan. I mean, look at it. If you guys want to know what Dan Reichert's aesthetic is, it's very clear. And every piece here has been chosen by him. Nobody it's told true. him what to do here. It's and look true. what happened. <laughs> well, I yeah, thank Bert you both uh, profusely for, uh, for getting me started on this. Um, and so, yeah, Mike, I'll, I'll toss over to you for the uh, official-ish uh, hosting uh, format, cool. moving us around stuff. So take it away. Yeah. So one more time, despite the fact that it'll probably go off the rails every which way at some point, uh, I'm going to go around the horn. We're all going to do, we've kind of loosely ranked these. Again, who knows what come January, how our minds will change as they always do as human beings. But I'll start with all our number fives and then we'll go to four. Uh, if there are any repeats, then, I mean, anytime, like say Mary mentions X game, we can all kind of wax poetic about it if we're passionate. Uh, yeah, and I'll then again, like, I have the whole list. Three, of, I'll say like, oh yeah. yeah, you know, that's my number three, but let's just talk about it now. And I have the whole like list of 2020 games, so I'm sure we'll talk about probably another like 15 or something after we rank them. So uh, fear not, I'll, we'll probably touch on a game people are here to hear about. Uh, but anyway, yeah, let's let's kick it off. Mary, what's your loose number five of 2020 so far? Okay, this one is probably maybe a spicy take. I doubt it's on any of your guys' lists. Um, I've been tinkering with how much I fell in love with this game, but I found myself putting a lot of hours into it and competing a lot and wanting to be good. So Fall Guys is my current number five on my list. It is a joy to try and learn. It is like kind of whimsical and silly. It's like being on a playground with a bunch of other toddlers, but every once in a while someone's hacking at somebody else's kneecaps to get to the finish line. I find it funny and enjoyable and silly, and I can kind of get drunk while I play it, so it's mm -hmm. a nice way to spend a Friday night. There's and enough downtime. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's good it downtime feels for good. drinking and everything. Yeah. It's it, Mario I, Party yeah. elements, it's like Mario Party mini games with like a game show aesthetic, which a little bit with a little bit of like one versus a hundred in there which, you know, I've loved all that stuff. Um, I actually, I, I considered putting it on my top five. I've got it under my, like, honorable mentions. But 
No, I know it's it's a phenomenon that like you know everyone talked about and everyone jumped on on board, but like no shame in, in putting that on the list because I I think that's an excellent excellent game. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun with it. I had like a solid two weeks of playing it. I haven't gone back in a while. Um, I don't. That might be just more due to me. I don't necessarily know how they've been updating it. I know that they've been pretty good on the cosmetic, the flow of like just constant cosmetics into it. Like I saw Ghost of Tsushima. Um, they they introduced a Ghost of Tsushima costume to it. So it's like now like I know that one that one week when they were like hitting top of Twitch charts and everything. Like yeah. everybody and their mom. Like every like fucking. Cheez Its and Taco Bell. I'm just naming corporation, but I know everybody was reaching out to them. Like, we want a costume in this game. Did, I reached out. Was to it? Them. Oh my god! Did you? <laughs> before did they, they did say? the whole branding thing, and before all, before it like really blew up, I was like, oh man, I should reach out and be like, hey, if they want to use Air Force Gator for Fall Guys, they can have them for free. Uh, and I reached they, out. Do they early. have an alligator? What's that? Do they have a gator? Like they just an a... any animal? That'd be such a neat costume. I don't know if they do. I, I mean, I haven't seen any of the new ones they put in, but uh, hey, hey, offer stands, the Fall Guys folks. If you want Air Force Gator, you got them. Oh, I love that. Um, Saj, I see, is saying that they have a Grease outfit, and there's a reason they have a Grease outfit, and it's because it's published by Devolver. So, of course, Devolver is going to make an outfit for every one of the other games that they own that they can market. But um, Reese? Weird, like weirdly... <laughs> no, no <laughs> the G-R-I-S... <laughs> That, oh, that indie game. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, I never played that. Like Olivia yeah, Newton Johnson, like Fall Guys. That... Hey, yo. <laughs> Actually, no. That's, He's that's the only one that Toronto. has a voice. Yeah. Here's your please. <laughs> Give me the crown, hey. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. That's not Greece. Be cool. <laughs> the crown's the only one I want. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Greece. Oddly enough. <laughs> has even gone out of the Devolver umbrella. They have a gun skin in Rainbow Six Siege for a character named Ella, which was very weird. And I still don't understand how they made that partnership. And I'm speaking to the, not to the choir here, because I don't think you guys play Siege much, but there is a grease, a grease skinned gun in Rainbow Six. So it's very weird. They did a lot of like cross branding. Huh, I didn't know Six uh, Rainbow Six did any of that like branding stuff. They've started doing more, but yeah, Greece is such a weird because that that game is so um, such such like an art house game that it felt odd to see it kind of going into these big commercialized or at least like big like uh, main hot topic games, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Fall Guys was Fall Guys was it has been super fun. I just haven't gone back to it in a while, so I'm not sure what they've been doing um, in terms of the long tail. Well, I think that's fair, and I would also say like it went it got to a point where I started fading. Uh, and I wasn't playing it as much anymore. And I did actually just start getting into some other like competitive games like that people are comparing it to, like Among Us. But I haven't put as many hours into that game, so it's harder for me to put that on a list yet. I do think it's it it's teetering. So this is one of those numbers where it's possible that my list will change. But at the time of me writing this and thinking about it, I thought, in 2020, did you spend a lot of time and did you enjoy that time? And I really did. Um, and I and I've recommended it to people. I recommended it to kids, and I've recommended it to friends because it's a enjoyable time to spend a few hours. And I like that. Not everybody is looking for an experience like Last of Us, right? Where you're just like, <laughs> all right, getting my head in the zone to play this extraordinarily stressful experience. Fall, like it's the opposite. Fall Guys is just like a joke to play, and you just like Good you just choice. enjoy your time with it, and then you forget that you, know, you just move on. You're done. Yeah, especially uh, like with streaming, I have found this year that I love games like Fall Guys and I've, uh, Tetris 99 is another one of them. Where like, let's say I do a couple hours of a game that I'm playing through and then it's like, well, I don't want to start another level because that's going to take a while, but I'm, I don't want to end streaming yet. I can just do a couple rounds of Fall Guys or a couple rounds of like Tetris 99 with Community. I kind of like those games that you can do in a like bite-sized type of way. This isn't necessarily a critique because I feel this is exactly what they were going for, but if anything... I would actually say Fall Guys' greatest strength, its accessibility, actually is kind of what didn't hook me for as long because I feel like it's it's too accessible. And that, that again, that's not a knock. It's such a weird critique because I, I think accessibility is super important. But like after a while, it felt like it is super fun to be drunk. And like I, to its credit, I play with um, like friends in Hoboken when there's a few of us hanging out. We play that now, like when we go home or like to our apartments or whatever. And 
I do feel like it's accessibility. And I can play with my nephew and I can play with my brother and it's it's very it could be mindless, but it's also like there is like motor skill involved, but I feel mm -hmm. like the lack of um I, there are other games on my list that do accessibility really well in a, in a way that doesn't really um completely mitigate skill. I guess was is my biggest critique of it, but again, it's exactly what they're going for, so it's hard to criticize them for it and i think they nailed the the way it's just inviting to everybody so you would say it's a game of skill fall guys uh, I, I would no i would say it's it, it, not later on in the life it's life oh god are there farts on again no no i, I was serious oh, no, no, no. No, no, no 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 i was saying the, i, I was saying say the opposite Mario party is a game of skill and everybody always says it sarcastically so game of skill is, is something i mean like uh, oh, no, there is skill involved with fall guys i'm not not sarcastically There's at all there's skill with Fall Guys, skill. for sure. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. feel like the skill, the skill ceiling is super low. So at a certain point, it's like, yeah. well, now I feel like I, I've gotten, I can't really get better at it. I can't practice it because eventually chance or accessibility will still fuck me over. But that's yep. what they were going for. So I think they still nailed what they wanted to make, which is a great. And that game's super fun. I think it's something where it's like with Siege, you know, I've played it and I recognize Siege is a great game. But I feel like if I went into a, a game of Siege, there's no chance in hell I'm going to do really well and, and win. Uh, whereas with Fall Guys, I think it's good at giving everyone the feeling that there's a chance you could win. Because it's simple enough, mm -hmm. like that everyone's gotten close. Everyone's gotten to that last round at least a few times, you know? So you feel like it's within reach. Yeah, yeah definitely. I love that. I love the way you said that. It's like, it's Plinko. It's a game that maybe you can think about a little bit, but there's also some chance involved. Um, even a blind pig can, you know, score an acorn once in a while. I've gotten really close and really felt like I didn't deserve it. I've also <laughs> played really well and lost and been kind of mad about it. You never really know, but I, I think, I think you can say justifiably that if you play the game a lot and you put in the hours and you learn, you can get more, yeah, I would bet you'd get more crowns than someone who was just like half-assing it and just going through it. Yeah, the real heartbreaker that I know a lot of people had this experience is uh, I had it the first time I got to the crown. And it's like, I'm totally going to get it. I, I'm in the lead here. It's mine. And then you jump up and don't realize you have to grab the crown. And you just you know, donk off of it. And it's like, God damn it. Yeah, you have oh, to yeah. learn that. And I think a lot of people get frustrated with the team games because justifiably, and this is probably going back to what Mike said, it doesn't matter how good you are. If your team sucks, you're going to lose. So mm -hmm. that's probably really frustrating for people who... Um, put a lot of time and energy into the game only to get ruined by shitty teammates. That probably does suck. I could see how that would be frustrating. I've actually seen a lot of people ask for no team modes where yeah. it's only your own skill and it yes. shouldn't be anything else. I think that's a pretty solid argument. I want that and I want the ability to do private lobbies where it's like I just share a code with the Twitch chat and it's like, hey, we're just us here. Because that's what I do with Tetris 99 and that is such a blast where it's like, Okay, let's fill up as many people as we can, and it's CPUs if you can't fill up the full 100, but then it's just only people from the live chat right then. So much fun. That would be so much fun, and I feel like they could develop that, but they spent all their ta their hours on the big Yetus. I question mm. where they're going in this next direction. I think it's going to be put into costumes and skins and weird alterations to the levels. I don't know if you guys saw the trailer to season two, but they've just added like more castle episode, like, like or sorry, levels. Like they look like castles with more edits to the, to the style. It doesn't mean that it's, I don't know, it's, it's better, it's more content, but yeah, it's called the Big Yeet Squig. It's just this giant hammer that like hits you in the ass and like sends you skyrocketing through the level. It's a way, it's the great equalizer, right? I have it's one of like, those. It's a way to make someone who's losing get shot right to the front of the pack. That's what it's. That's what its goal it's is. It's a blue I shell. Think. Yeah, oh, it's yeah, a blue yeah. shell. I can see that. Uh, tonally, though, that game is always just a joy to play. Mm. Being stuck. In, it's just joy. nice to play. It's like it's like the polar opposite of Last of Us. Tonally. Yes. yes. Um, it literally is. Yes. It's if they were on a spectrum. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. The big Yetus is on the opposite. Um, yes. anyway, cool. So Mary, uh, loose number five is Fall Guys. Great game. Dan, let's move yeah. to you. What's your five? Well, first of all, Mike, you've, you've seen the liquor globe in person. It's my globe that I keep liquor in. It's very, very yeah. nice. Uh, it now, yeah. found out a little ice bucket can fit right in there. Fits one can <laughs> at a time, nice and cold. What is that you're drinking? Uh, that's a, oh, 
I went to the uh, liquor store today. This is Bright Blonde Ale. It's uh, in Stamford here. They make it here, so I don't know. I'm no fancy beer guy, but I'll try a local place anytime. Wait, what is the name of the brewery? Bright? That can looks familiar. Half familiar. Oh. Half full. Oh. Mm. oh, yeah. I actually just had that the other day. They have it at a place here. It's good. Yeah, yeah. I'm I like it. it. Uh, but number five, it's, it's actually this beer is number five. Um, oh. No, it is... Uh, Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Oh. I did not love the first one. I was not huge on it. I thought it was gorgeous. I thought the music was great. Not as great as Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, if uh, any of you remember that Game of the Year conversation. But uh, it was just aesthetically and orally. Do you pronounce <laughs> this orally different than that orally? Not really. A-U. Or orally. Or orally. It's orally real good. Orally. Or with your ears, it's orally uh, sounds good. Sounds Wouldn't good in your like, ears. Could or you say audibly, no. Yeah, audibly also works, but that's an actual word. A u r a l. No, I think orally would be more. I think audibly means more like it's it's audible, like it's a measure of how well you can hear it. Whereas orally is more the aesthetic quality of hearing. Okay. Yeah, well, but I it also we has do have Dan Hour in the chat. I think it is hourly. Guys. Yeah. Dan hourly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a word. I got a good vocab. Look at me. Oh, it's totally a word. Yeah, I. It's just a really terrible word to say out loud, which which is tripping you up. Okay, hearable. It was real good, hearable in my uh, my ears. Um, but, sounds like a podcast app. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, but no, something about the uh, the like actual Metroidvania business going on with the first one didn't hook me. That I, I didn't feel like there's enough of a progression or. Uh, on a gameplay perspective, I didn't think it was deep enough, really. Whereas this one, I was like, well, I got Game Pass. It's not going to hurt to try it out. It got really good reviews. Um, but, man, I I thought on the gameplay front, and, and also the story front, the story was incredible. The thing with the, the owl and, and all the unpleasantness, uh, that stuff was, uh, you know, tugging at the heartstrings and all that stuff. Um, but, yeah. Did it's, you it's cry, like, Dan? I did not cry. A video game is yet to make me cry. Um mm-hmm. What did they, oh, Fast and Furious 7 did. We determined that was the one movie that made me cry. Um, because the man actually uh, died. That's real life. And they did a, a sorrowful right, montage yeah. at the end with a sad song. That's It was a touching moment for a very real thing. How, how dare you? How dare both of you laugh I'm, I'm laughing because Mary's laughing. I'm not laughing at you. I can cut both, your, I can cut both your cams. Because I thought it was probably like when The Rock like did some kind of sick move and you were like, that's beautiful. It's, it's when he flexed out of his cast and said, Daddy's got to yeah. go to work. That's when I just started sobbing. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, th- okay. Speaking of Fast and Furious and I guess Hobbs and Shaw by extension, when Dan uh, when Dan glimpsed Helen Mirren at this uh, Death Stranding event, I, sa- I said, holy shit, Helen Mirren is here. Because we didn't expect her to be there. And Dan's like, holy shit, that's the, that's the woman from Hobbs and Shaw. I was like, yeah, that's what she's known for, is Hobbs and Shaw. I knew of her outside of the realm. I have not seen anything of her outside of Hobbs and Shaw, but I was aware she had a larger repertoire. Yeah, Uh, anyway, but um, yeah, Fast and Furious 7, I have not seen yet. Anyway, yeah, Ori and the Will of the Wisps. It, uh, Orly, Orly, uh, Orly. Oh, really? Ori is orally good. It's not, yeah, it's not even a joke. Um, (laughs) I thought that the gameplay part, like the actual progression and like all the different abilities and everything, I think it was just kind of like leaps and bounds ahead of the original one. Uh, I think I 100% of it. Like I'm a sucker for a good uh, Metroidvania. It's I am such a sucker for that. Mary, this is one thing. This this is previous years, but one thing. I know you love Hollow Knight. That was the one I could not get into. Yeah, we're gonna have fighting words about that at some point in our <laughs> lives. I think um, we can can continue to have some kind of understanding on how damn good Ori is. Uh, it's on my list, so we will talk about it again much later in th- this show, oh, just to okay. give you a perspective of how much I loved it. I also loved the original Ori. Um, I am really a huge sucker for Metroidvania games, and so this really, really hit me in my core because it's a tremendous story. It's a tight platformer. You do have to get really good at the game over time if you wanna like see all the content and get all those extras. If you want 100% the game, you have to really max out that character and I think that's a real joy. It's stunning to look at. It is actually a joy in your ears. The music is good, the sound effects are great. Um, Lots of 
wonderful detail. But again, like those stories with Ori and the owls, it, <laughs> I did cry when I played it. It was really beautiful to experience that game, but then also be pushed to the brink of madness on some of the platforming aspects of it. So it's just a perfect blend to me. That's, that's my personal perfect game is a game that pushes you emotionally and, and feeds you a good story, but also pushes you as a player. And I'm not talking about just giving you upgrades where it gives you a double jump. That's one type of thing. But what I'm talking about is the pushing of the player to actually increase their skill. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of time to get the skill that you need to finish that game. Whether or not you have all the upgrades or not, it is really difficult. There's very particular areas I can think of like this one where you're going through the tree stumps and it shoots you out at a different area. It's, um, I don't know, what would you call that? Like a time space continuum where you're just like being shot out of a different area. Yeah. And that one will really mess with your brain and it's difficult. And so it pushes you in all these different ways. It's just a brilliant game. It was, is expertly crafted and I, I probably, I'll say more about it later. It's awesome. Yeah, those moments where, uh, like, those big kind of set piece moments where something is chasing you or it's a boss fight and, like, the, the world is collapsing around you and, like, you're going to die a ton of times. But then when it all kind of clicks and you know, okay, here's the part where that tree falls down. Here's the part where I have to do all that little, like, kind of dash arrow thing across those floating things. Like, once you've got it all figured out, you feel like, like you're Neo in the Matrix. And it's just like, okay, this, 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 jump here, dodge this, wait, go. Like, loved those moments. I've been wanting to go back to it. I really enjoyed it, but I actually, I got like overwhelmed with how much there was to collect and how many side things. To, to Again, to its credit, like everything, most of the stuff you're getting to the side is contributing to the character and you're getting better with it. So none of it's really just like collectibles for collectibles sake, but I almost got overwhelmed. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, that game, the game is fantastic. Uh, I really enjoyed the first game, the first when I played it back in what, 2000, was that 15? It was 15, yeah. I can't um, believe that. But no, I, I do want to. I want to go back to Will of the Wisps. I just need to. Dan, did you finish the first game? No, I fell off. It just wasn't hooking me from a gameplay perspective, and I fell off. And like honestly, that's kind of what I expected here. I thought I would play two or three hours and be like, "All right, I can appreciate the art and what they're doing here." But like, no, the gameplay kept me going. Yeah, I, I found that the first one is rougher. I mean, there's no denying there's rougher edges in the first one. Um, but much like this one, finishing the game is really satisfying because your character gets so strong towards the last 20% of the game. It makes you feel so good. And I feel, I, I wonder if it passes the test of time, but I remember when I played it, I had some frustrations with it, but the way I felt when I completed it, and my God, if you like the story in this one, the story in the first one is also like a little heart puller um that one is our, has a really solid ending too they always nail the endings with these and they always have like really good themes and morals that are more complicated than just like this is a bad character you're looking at like complex animals that have been bullied because they look different but they want parents too <laughs> <laughs> that's the theme <laughs> yeah no it, it all worked honestly Tolstoy talked that, about that too what did uh, I said Tolstoy talked about that pretty often. Oh, is that one of your book guys? <laughs> is Tolstoy one of my book guys? <laughs> you heard yeah. me? Yeah, he is. He's up He's up there among the Mike, book people. Mike, if I were to test you, um, here, let's take bets, Mary. Uh, I bet Mike could produce a Tolstoy novel on camera in less than seven seconds. Uh, no, I could not. What? Yeah, I can't. I have most of my Russian literature is actually still packed away. Him, Nabokov, Dostoevsky are Shut all in up. a box hang together. On. Hang on, bring the farts back. Hang on. Hang Wait, on. yes, bring Tell us about your okay. Russian literature collection. I'll, no, I'll read something. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our... Beautiful. It's beautiful, Mike. Um... But yeah, Ori was good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ori was good, and this stream is art. 
Yes. <laughs> it's, very, it's very Baruch. Yeah, um, that's what I was saying. Okay, should I do uh, my number five? No, that's what Dan was saying. I was saying it was, it was orally Baroque. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. That's going to be a pull quote on the definitive edition box. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that's my uh, number five there. Okay. My number five is something I did not expect uh, I would actually like, but I thoroughly enjoyed Kentucky Route Zero. What is this face, Dan? <laughs> I that, is that that's an adventure game, right? No, so it's the it's been coming out. It, it's fifth episode released in January, I believe. It's correct, yeah. January and it's it's yeah, it's like an adventure, almost point and clicky kind of walking simulator, a blend of all these like puzzles in certain parts, but very much a game I would not normally enjoy. Not that I don't appreciate those kind of games. I'm all for Gone Home. I don't really like point and clicks as much as I used to, but it's a five episode kind of arc through this very, um, it kind of changed shapes as it goes throughout its episodes. But though difficult to describe, I actually found it really, really effective at what it was doing. It reminded me a lot of my childhood. It's very much like a Midwestern kind of road trip. It's also, it's very magical realism focused kind of so which a, a lot of the stuff i read or like movies i watch is kind of in line with that again very much like a thing where i was just kind of i didn't i wrote it off as a bit pretentious before i uh played it but the more i played it the more you I'm like, wrote it off as pretentious <laughs> yeah read us some more of your literature tolstoy <laughs> <laughs> oh, what wine are you drinking it insists uh, it's on itself H- hot medoc it's one of the like more prominent vintners and the Bordeaux region. You hope they your dog what? Hot Medoc. It's a 2015. It's like a, um, it's gone. I got to refill it, but it's a Cab So, or no, sorry. Yeah, Cabernet Sauvignon mixed with a Merlot. It's a nice I didn't even know you French got a dog. One. I don't know what you're saying. Are the farts on or no? I just turned it on again. Yeah. They're on right now? <laughs> That's going to be my like lifeline whenever a bit's just not working. I'm just going to hit the farts. Oh, they're on right now? No, not now. Okay. Not now. Not now. Oh, okay, gotcha. No. Um, but yeah, Kentucky Route Zero, and I also there's a bunch of there are a lot of a lot of the subplots really worked for me. There's one specifically where they were kind of like talking about how like a heroin epic. They wouldn't they use didn't use heroin in name, but basically, again, you you sit down in this dive bar in the middle of this like highway. It's like a Route 66 kind of thing, and you sit down and you kind of get to like you pick the lyrics of the song as it's going. Uh, it's very beautiful music throughout the whole game. Again, it's I, I'm very surprised I liked it so much, but so many of the subplots worked for me on a personal level, and I really enjoyed it. And I, I also just from a game design perspective, it was very, it was super varied throughout. It, like it could be a very puzzle focused, and then it'd be more exploration, talking to these people. Super well written, and then the next episode would be you're on this riverboat going down this this like haunted river with this mammoth that everybody's just like, Oh yeah, it's a mammoth powered steamboat. It's, it's very confident in how it uses all these weird. Again, it's, it's like halfway between magical realism, almost like this Gothic American thing. I I really, it's hard to explain, but I really enjoyed it. A lot of people like it for just how well it's written. And I have to say, I liked it for the same reason. Now, is it, has it been out for like a long time? Cause I feel like I've heard that title for years, like back at Giant Bomb yeah. and everything, and I just did it just come out finally. The fifth episode it started finally. Started in 2015, I want to say, and the fifth episode came out today, so it's quite possible. No, no, no January. We were like, uh, or sorry, today it came this out year. in January yeah, 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 this yeah. year. Yeah. Um, it's funny because we probably were all working at Giant Bomb and GameSpot when this game came out, so we've probably been in some way talking about this game for ages. Um, and to see it actually come to completion is quite shocking. I also started playing it when I was at GameSpot, I'm fairly confident, and and played the final one this year, and I also really enjoyed it, Mike. I didn't put it on my list because I forgot about it, which is not a good sign, but I really liked it. I think it was just so long ago, I forgot, but I did really enjoy it. I played it on the Switch, and it was a really nice experience because it's kind of like playing a book, and so you can sit and just enjoy it and have this interactive experience. And much like Mike, it is surreal. 
So you're doing normal things, like maybe you're going to an office, but the office is really odd and maybe it's underground and um, you're just in kind of these fantastical worlds, but they're rooted in reality. So something is off, but you're not quite sure what it is. And a lot of times it's symbolic. Um, there was definitely like, this iconic scene where like an eagle is carrying us around and I feel like it's trying to like tell us a lot about um, our healthcare system and uh, corporate America and what it's like to, you know, what we care about in our regular lives. I think it's saying a lot, but I do think that it is a lot of text and it's completely narrative driven. So this isn't a game for everyone. This is an experience where you're gonna wanna sit back and read a lot. And, and if you are into that, I think you would really enjoy the experience. It, it, it's a pretty cool game. Okay. And there's, there's, there's a few aspects like um, X-Files or Control. There's like this bureau that you go to and they have, it's just very funny going through all their different, uh, the cases that they have. Um, but yeah, I don't think if, I don't have any urge to play it like now. And it is kind of easy to forget about because it was kind of like early 2020, which feels like a decade ago. Um, I forgot. But yeah, it's, I liked it a lot. And yeah, I played it on Twitch as well. But everything about it, just it, it, it's presentation, it's music, it's tone, it's writing. It's, again, like I just, each episode was so structurally different that I had a blast going through all five of them at once. I didn't play any of it until this year. I wasn't like waiting for the fifth episode desperately. I, I feel like just hearing you guys talk about this makes me realize that like, it's maybe one of the, the pitfalls of not, working at giant bomb anymore is like these type of games like this sounds like a game that i'm sure that like Vinny and abby and alex would talk about and love and everything and i would just kind of like through osmosis learn about it but since yeah. like now it's just you know kind of me in a vacuum it's just, i'm much quicker to like gravitate towards the things like well, mario or this thing but then i'll like hear two sentences about like adventure or narrative heavy and just you know we'll totally like not think about it uh so like hearing you guys talk about it it's like oh right okay there's probably value in like kind of going outside of the bubble of stuff i know i like and you know i, I Nav might enjoy navarro that. was the one who sold me on it yeah yeah because i i haven't really been paying as much attention i remember like i read polygon's review of like the first episode of like what 2012 13 it was a while ago now and i just had no interest in it but that's kind of that's that's kind of what's funny too it's like people who've been playing it throughout the whole lifespan or like how much their game taste has changed since the first episode but they've stuck with it um, yeah, I don't know. It was really impressive in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, that's my number five. All There's right. There's some good themes in there. I think it's worth, I think I'm glad you put it on your list. I actually yeah. totally forgot about it, but I feel like it warrants discussion because it does so much, um, with, with the theme. And even though, like I said, I really do admit it's not for everyone. I would like blatantly say, I don't know, Dan, if you would enjoy it, but I think it's super worth you hearing about. <laughs> well, and, and I, you maybe know, just... Just in general, I found it. there have been enough times that, like, if I tried out a game that I initially would have written off, which, like, I, I've been less prone to do that uh, as I've gotten older, because it's like, there have been enough times where it's like a Stardew Valley where I wouldn't have looked at that twice unless I was assigned that mm -hmm. for a quick look. And then I wound up, like, absolutely loving it. So, I'm, you know, I've definitely gotten better about, like, okay, this might not on paper sound like a game for me, but, like, maybe I should give it a shot. It's a... It's a it struck a chord with me. I, I was doing road trips constantly as a kid. Um, and it's very much a road trip narrative across like this Midwestern America, but it also felt like upstate New York to me. There's a subplot involving this, like, um, this corporation, this medical corporation that's developing this drug that's getting people hooked on opiates. It's very much, it felt like the heroin crisis in New England and New York and New Jersey to me, which like has affected me in several ways growing up. So like, it just, yeah, it's just it's just super well written. And again, that's not my normal type of game. I just keep, decided to give it a try. I think maybe I got like a code for it. And I was like, I might as well. And it was on Switch. I think I played the first episode like in bed super late at night. Maybe on a maybe on a trip. But and it just like it it got its hooks in me tonally. Just this very haunted, magical, uh, surreal kind of experience and stuck with me. I think about it a lot. How about orally? Orally, audibly, hearably. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was, oh, really an orally good game. By the way, speaking of Switch, uh, I, I saw people saying that uh, Ori is on Switch now. Yeah, so, that was super, was that, that wasn't too long ago, was it? 
That had to be recently because I, I was not aware that it, it came. I, I wonder how well that runs. I mean, that game. It was. A lot going it, on. it had a day one patch, and I played it. This this is not a knock against the game. They released the day one patch, but before it came out on, I played it on Xbox One. It was. No matter what I was doing, it, it, they had a huge problem. It was running at like ten frames a second, but then they fixed it immediately. It was good. Chat's um, saying it's perfect. They're saying run sixty frames a second. Perfect. That's awesome. I maybe that'll be the way I go back to it because I do want to play that before consoles come out or play it on Series X or something. I don't know. Hmm. Um, okay, cool. So that's my five. Mary, what is or yeah, Mary, what is your number four? All right, you guys ready for something out of the woodwork? Yes. yes. Once you name it, I'm gonna go really quick to refill my hope my dog. You hope your dog what? I hope my dog, <laughs> uh, my my Tolstoy proof rock wine. Are you having a stroke? I wish. I hope he's okay. <laughs> I'm fine. What's your What's your four? Well, we were just talking about how we like Metroidvania style games. So let's talk about Carry On. Let's talk uh, about the game where you're a monster and you eat lots of people constant. who are scientists in a lab. And as you consume their bodies, you gain additional powers as a monster and um, you can climb walls and you have a different um, physical body in water. And so you play it completely different, whether you're in liquid, um, there are actual passive ways to play the game. So you don't have to murder everybody. That's not the way I chose to play it, but you could in fact do a passive run of the game where you just um, avoid being shot or being hit with a flamethrower. Carry on is a really fascinating concept where you are a monster and you're just scooping up little scientists and uh, hovering them over your jowls and watching them scream until you consume them. And, and the it's animation, a delight to play. The animation yeah. on the, the monster itself is insane. And like, So tell me this, because I played it for like hour, hour and a half on stream when it first came out. And I thought it was super cool, like the uh, just the like locomotion of being this thing and like the power you feel is, is awesome. But in like the first hour, hour and a half, I felt like I wasn't like there wasn't a ton of progression outside of like size and things like that. And I heard it was a really short game. So do you find that in like the the later parts of the game that there is like do you feel like you're progressing or is it kind of a steady tone throughout? It's, it's a, a reasonable pace for the size of the game. So it's not a long experience and I will acknowledge that, but I would say that I found myself always intrigued that there was something new to learn. So the game was always pushing you to learn the next skill or giving you a different uh, scenario in which you had to use your skills in a unique way. Um, so I appreciated how often I was put in a situation where I was like, oh, in this situation, I have to consume a very particular thing so that I can get through a laser so that I can murder these men. And then I have to go through the water so that I can open up the vault and get to the next space. It's, it's half puzzle, um, but it's also half Metroidvania where you're just acquiring a skill and then you learn how to utilize that skill properly. Um, but I would say generally, I just really liked thematically the idea of being a villain. It's, it's totally different than most games. Oh, yeah, especially, like, even in the genre uh, where you're usually the one that's overwhelmed. And I see Cosmic Fly in the chat makes a good point, says, uh, and I won't say the name of what he's talking about here, but he says, Carry On is basically the end sequence of another indie game yes. that came out a few years ago. He said, I won't say oh, because really? of spoilers, but if you know, you know. And, like, yeah, and that was a incredibly memorable sequence in that game. So, And Carry On is actually really, despite having a definite indie feel, and I don't mean that as an insult at all, but it's actually pretty systemically impressive. Like it's got the whole, if you're on fire, go into water. And it's got it, like the way you can actually balance certain um, enemy types or enemy types, quote unquote, you are the enemy. But I, I was really impressed with how deep that game got. We did, we had them on our GDC stage like three years ago. I believe they're Polish developers. And I was like, this game seems really cool. And it, it, people are mentioning Maneater in chat too. It's like, they're both monster games that had a different take on it and stuff. But Carry on just felt really good to play. Apparently, you could do a pacifist run where you don't kill anybody, which I don't. I can't even begin to wrap my mind around how you would do that. No, the game no. is that game like does have a lot of depth to it. Yeah, hell of a look, hell of a concept. I, I was impressed with what I saw. 
it's a joy to play and I, I think I should probably preface. I said this before we started the stream, but I altered my, <clears throat> this is this is a list that will probably change. And I do alter my lists in some ways because I really like talking about games that I think that are really wonderful for what they are. I do think about what my experience is before I start, what my expectations are. Carry On overwhelmed my expectations because it's a really neat concept and it's executed fairly well. It's an indie game at the end of the day. You shouldn't go into it and expect this like incredibly deep, long experience. It's a short game that does what it does well. And that's why I put it on this list. You're gonna see like, I bet, a lot of people, are, we're gonna be talking about a very particular game later that's done, it's just executed so flawlessly, but I had those expectations going into it. And so this is something I put on my list because I felt like it deserved to be honored here and talked about. I do that a lot, even though that's not really fair and in probably the good name of lists, I sometimes will alter my list because I know you guys put stuff on your list and I wanted to talk about this game. Awesome. And yeah, people have mentioned that's just yet another triumph for Game Pass, introducing a, like a game that might not have been as prevalent, but just really brought it to the forefront. Um, then, yeah, you know, Carry On's great. I want to say this here uh, just because it came up briefly, but Maneater almost made it uh, to my number five spot. Yeah. That, it's on my I honorable like mention it should list. should have been on your number five because you played that game a lot, Dan. I that was your first. I beat that was one of your first streams. streams. Two streams, yeah. I beat it. Like I played the first one in like an eight-hour chunk, and then like a three-hour chunk. I just loved it so much because it's like, I, I don't love games that are like meme games where it's like specifically like, oh, isn't this wacky that you're a piece of toast or bread? And it's like, all right, <laughs> that was novel at first when it was like, oh, goat simulator, what a wacky idea. But then like I feel like Steam got so littered with that stuff, you know, where it's like, oh, here's the one where you're a suicide guy or you're I am toast man or whatever, you know. It's like the meme games and it's like sharknado triggered a wave of them exactly and that's the thing is like i think man eater if it went too far in one direction it would rub me the wrong way like those other ones do but i feel like it's it obviously knows how ridiculous it is but it doesn't it's not constantly winking at you like aren't we silly aren't we stinkers like you know you got like chris parnell doing just a, a bit of a hammy narration you've got these ridiculous upgrades for your shark and everything like it knows it's goofy but it doesn't constantly have to like look at the camera and tell you that so like i loved man eater so not on my I list but like i just had to say that i feel like this is like a good distinction and that's kind of why i like this group is because uh, if i had that experience with man eater man eater would be on my list and it would be high because i put things that i was not anticipating and unexpectedly enjoyed even if it's like a uh, kind of like a unique experience specifically for me, I put those really high if I just felt like I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, and this, this definitely hit those notes for me. I didn't totally get what it was going for, and I, I remember I tuned in, and this was like your third or fourth stream, I think, Dan. Um, early, and I tuned yeah. in, and he had like a Gatling gun on his back, and he was shooting lightning out of his mouth. I, yes. was... I had the weird lightning teleport thing, which as soon as I got that upgrade, it's like, oh, great, I can be a lightning shark that teleports onto ships and... Oh man, Hades just ripped that off pretty much. Yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's exactly. We'll get into that later. Because we'll talk I do to think Greg to Hades seven. stole a lot from Maneater. Most, most totally. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, Dan. What is your number four? Number four for me, Tony Hawk. Um, man, it is. Uh, I I adore those old Tony Hawk games. And even, like, long past, you know, when it kind of jumped the shark. Speaking of which, Maneater. Have you guys played Maneater? No. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it kind of did jump the shark after maybe the first Underground. You know, like, Underground 2, people weren't super hot on. And then, like, Proving Ground, Project 8, American Skate Land, you know, uh, mileage varies or whatever. Um, but I, I even kind of loved it all through that. Um, outside of, like, the Wii ones. I don't, I don't need to go through a whole Tony Hawk history. But anyway, when they did the Tony Hawk HD on XBLA a long time ago, years ago, I was like, hell yeah, I want to be able to play Tony Hawk, classic Tony Hawk, on current consoles and HD. That's perfect. But then they blew it. It didn't feel right. And that is the most important thing about Tony Hawk is the feel, the gameplay. And 1 and 2, like from the second I started that warehouse demo before it came out, I was like, they did it. This is the thing. And it's they did enough new things to where it didn't just feel like a reskin um, but it also did not mess with what worked so well. Even, like, the new soundtrack stuff works great. You know, they added, like, one kind of uh, set of objectives to each level that all kind of fit in seamlessly. 
you know, collectibles and stuff. It has its own, like the whole challenge system is pretty in-depth. Uh, new collectibles and, and little Easter eggs and stuff. It is uh, so in the spirit of what I loved about Tony Hawk 1 and 2 back in the day. Um, I mean, if, if I made one mistake with it, it's that I, I pl- went so hard on that in the first couple weeks it came out that I think I burnt through damn near. You know, I didn't do every single challenge, but I got almost every trophy except for the multiplayer ones. Uh, you know, I, I totally got every challenge for, you know, three or four different skaters and just absolutely adored my time with that. 2020 has been super interesting as far as remakes go because Resident Evil 3, we expected to really overhaul the game, but Final Fantasy 7 took one of the most beloved games ever and really uh, fucked with it several in several ways, in a good, and as, you know, by and large, most people say in a good way. Tony Hawk seems like it's good because it was faithful. Yeah. Mm. Like, I, did it make any, like, sweeping changes to your memory of the original games, or did you like it specifically because it just really kind of respected the source material? No, I think that's a good sign of a, a good remake is if you play it and it reminds you of how it felt back when you played it. Because a lot of times you go back to these games and you're like, oh, I remember this looking sharper than this or controlling better than this. Um, and I think a good remake just kind of makes it feel l- like your memory of like 20 years ago or whatever. And uh, this one totally, totally does that. Because I've gone back and I've, I've played one and two since then. And it's like, it just doesn't feel as, as crisp and just spot on as this new one. So I really hope they do three uh, DLC or they put out three plus four or something like that because they nailed it. They completely nailed it. Um, Were you one of the people who would be like a heavy critic of when the series kind of started to lose its luster and everyone started getting really frustrated with the series as it just dropped off? Or was that not something that you participated in? Because some of the fanfare, I feel like, came from the fact that because the series lost its way so significantly, the fact that they brought it back from the dead added more value to it well i think when a lot of people started turning on it was tony hawk 4 because it started that's when it it opened up it made it more like an the the levels were open and you could skate around and accept missions and things like that and that rubbed people the wrong way but i loved it because um it still had those two minute challenges in, in each one of those levels so i felt like it had the classic stuff but also expanded upon it um i think if there was one where it kind of lost me it was underground 2 where it was just like okay I like this because this is a really uh, tightly controlling skateboarding game. But Underground 2 was like jackass skateboarding, which, by the way, I love jackass. Jackass is incredible entertainment. Um, but it's like I don't want to be, you know, Bam Margera in a diaper going down a hill in a, in a shopping cart or, you know, playing like a tennis mini game. Like I want to do a really good skateboarding game. So that was the one that kind of yeah. lost me. That was a mood in the 90s, wasn't it? Just that everybody... That we were like marketed that we really wanted to be Bam Margera, and the reality was nobody wanted to be Bam Margera. Oh no, God, no! He'd be the worst one to be. <laughs> yeah, that was that was like my, the early aughts. It was very like him hanging out on his weird ranch in Pennsylvania with his incestuous family. I don't know if they were incestuous. I, I, I never, should... even in my uh, biggest jackass fandom days, he was the one that always just annoyed me. I just did not like Bam Margera. I'd, Knoxville, Pontius, Steve-O, sure, cool. Um, but yeah, bam, I was just like, I don't like this guy. He was the Peter Chris of the Jackass tribe. He was the one that existed, but everyone just allowed it. Yeah. Yeah, to Chad's point, I don't think Bam Margera wants to be Bam Margera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why would you? Um, but yeah, Tony Hawk, I mean, from the little I played, I, 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 so that's the thing. I never got into like the arguably what gives it most of its longevity. I never really got into the score chasing which I didn't really get into the manuals between tricks. And I, I usually played them for the, the single player and collecting everything, all the t- videotapes and unlocking the, you know, the gymnasium and the moon and whatnot. But I still haven't really given Tony Hawk 1 and 2, the remakes, a solid chance yet. And that's another thing that's on my... That's why it's kind of more on my honorable mention side. I, I played with you and... It was a very it was a very close competition, but at the end you came out on top. A close game of KFBR three nine two. Yeah, I don't think I I don't think you got a single letter. I don't think so. No, <laughs> no I got my ass kicked. Uh, uh, but yeah, I haven't like, played it. I haven't played this round, so I can't. I have to abstain. But I have fond memories of um, the second one, and very specifically um, the. Uh, 
what are they the RL oh, the RL memories because it yes. had the best soundtrack of any video game that ever had a soundtrack and you would put it on and not even play it because mm -hmm. you just wanted to listen to the radio and so that's kind of my memories that would suck me back and so my number one question would be what's the soundtrack of of the of 1 plus 2 is it no of the of this one is it good yeah no it's it is like largely i don't know the actual percent but like i would say over half of the songs are classics the ones you remember from one yeah. and two like gorilla radio and stuff uh, is on there um there are some new ones but i think by and large they fit i muted maybe six or seven of them that just didn't jive with me but uh yeah it's, it's goldfinger it's uh, primus it's rage against the machine it is excellent Oh my god, I think I actually found out about Primus through that video game, which is so odd to think about. It's probably like, Wouldn't Superman? that be so weird to like listen to Pork Soda and be like, this is just like the video game. I think it was South Park for me. South Park and then Tony Hawk right afterwards. <laughs> Who sings Tony Hawk? Who What's sings the band? What? Uh oh. Superman? Did did, uh, did I cut out? Goldfinger. Thank video? you, Goldfinger. Goldfinger does Superman, yeah. Okay, that yeah, that's I, I got introduced to. I don't know that Goldfinger has many other songs, do they? I don't know. I remember listening to a lot of good Goldfinger when I was younger. I don't know if people like consider them a touchstone. I, I saw them in concert actually with Real Big Fish after this game came out, and I remember them playing Superman. That's all I remember. So maybe they just played that like twelve times and left. <laughs> what Chat is, is angry about Primus. <laughs> I didn't know it was so controversial. Uh, do they not like it? Do they like it? They don't like it. I didn't know that. No. I like grew up listening to Primus. Huh. I forget. Tony Hawk just needs more Dave Matthews, then I'll play it. Yeah. Get um, out of here. Cool. So that was your number four. Yep. Um, all right. I'll go on to my number four. It is Wasteland 3. Uh, I saw when this came out, a lot of people were disappointed with it, technically. I didn't have many... Uh, I didn't have many hiccups i thought it actually ran super smoothly um but i really enjoyed wasteland 3 i felt it was a it's a very streamlined crpg i really enjoy crpgs i like disco elysium maybe not as much as a lot of people will seem to worship it i'm really excited for Baldur's gate 3 i really liked um divinity like anything um sorry what is the why i'm blanking on uh Baldur's gate developer what the, why the hell? Don't help him. him. Nobody help him. <laughs> no, don't not help me. Uh, Larian Studios. I really love everything they've done, but Wasteland 3, does Dan tuning out because he doesn't like CRPGs? Oh, you said CRPG. <laughs> Sorry. My couch oh, my, my couch has a built-in voice command thing. So <laughs> it just reclines whenever to hear CRPG, but go on. Uh, I really liked it. it most of the things I, I enjoy about post-apocalyptic <laughs> games are Fallouts, and this reminds me very much of er Fallout 1 and 2, is the inventory management, and that's there, and you're building this like six-person party, and I thought it was just the right amount of freedom but not too much i would actually say sometimes i know divinity has kind of overwhelmed a lot of people which i get despite loving that game but there's a lot going on and i think wasteland 3 actually pairs it down in a way it's a smaller team but i really enjoyed wasteland 3 um it to the point where that was like my i just dove into it for like two weeks and finished it is and it, that was the only thing i was playing is it isometric i feel like i've seen like screenshots and is it like yeah like top yeah um and then the, the combat you yes i believe i didn't play a co-op um i the the combat's like xcom light um a lot of people don't really like the turn-based combat uh in that game specifically i thought it was fine it was serviceable um so but yeah does it go I, back and I, forth between it. like so like xcom when i think of that combat it like throws you into an encounter and then back out to like a hub or something like is this one that's have xcom combat and then you're kind of free to explore a world until the next thing it is it's a totally it's a totally open world i mean there's it's sectioned off but there is a there's a central open world in which you're driving this truck through the tundra of colorado you came down from arizona you're the you're the arizona rangers from the first two games and you came up and you get ambushed that's not a spoiler that happens right away but basically you are when you go into encounters it, it goes right say you're part you you're controlling your party and you have six people and they're coming up toward the enemies wherever you were when they notice you that's where the battle starts 
So you can do some stealth things like you can in Divinity where you can get someone up behind them over here to ambush them. But if you're not like expecting a fight, then you can get really fucked over if you're not in position. I'm, I've, I've been save scumming that game a lot. Um, but it's very much, yeah, it goes straight out of the combat into isometric open world exploration. This game um, looks great. Sort of Sorry. Uh, yes, I believe In Exile, Brian Fargo and them did, uh, it, it was originally a Kickstarter. Got it, okay. Uh, Wasteland 2 would have been 2017? I might, maybe 16? Um, but yeah, I'm loving it. I know a lot of people were disappointed with it. Again, I, I didn't have any technical issues. If anything, like, load times could have been a little bit better at first, but I think they patched it, and now I've been having a lot of... It's just, it's also a very, it reminds me of Fallout 1 and 2. It's a very solid post-apocalyptic RPG it's, it's less like a CRPG than it is kind of like a Fallout, isometric Fallout game with a party of six people. Um, Chad is saying it's on uh, Game Pass as well. Dude, yeah. that's awesome. That sounds so cool. This actually sounds right up my alley because I was in love with Divinity Original Sin and exactly like what you said, I fell off because um, there's just a lot of elements to it. And so um, once you play through, there's really not a lot of reason to play through again. It's the same campaign. And so I've been kind of like kind of looking for that next campaign that gives yeah. me this kind of style of gameplay this sounds sounds it, exactly like what i was looking for i kind yeah. of feel embarrassed that i didn't play it yet this sounds so good i would say the story is pretty generic post-apocalypse like your enemies are all these like cannibalistic spiky armored uh like I crude humor shit. guys yeah but it sounds good borderlands-esque type yeah. little fuckers yeah but, running but around you, but you are there's a shit ton of people you can recruit it's it's kind of reminds me of suikoden 2 where you're building or i don't know dragon age inquisition to a more vanilla aspect but you're building up this base recruiting people you are fleshing out like different aspects of your base you're hiring a cook you're hiring a medic you're building up this kind of like small army of militia you're rebuilding the rangers in colorado and you're you're managing reputation with these different factions uh, it, it's just fantastic it's a very uh, saying it's a CRPG is almost a bit misleading. It's it's more of this post pot It's like an isometric Fallout, but again, with a party of six people that you can pull from a pool of like 40 characters and build them out like really disparate combat styles. And um, just, it's, I, I, I went into it for like 50 hours straight over two weeks and I was just totally absorbed with it. I feel like I have to tell Bianca about this. This sounds very up her alley. It's great. It's so it, if, much fun. To Mary's point, yeah. if anybody re if anybody got overwhelmed with Divinity, which I, I agree is like a master class in CRPG, this is like this is like um, if Divinity was like just smoking weed all the time, just very relaxed, pared back, kind of fo laser focused on the fundamentals. You um, are selling this game for it's me. It's great. It's good, and apparently, like people are saying, co op makes it better. I didn't play co op yet, but I imagine it would be just similar to Divinity. Um, I, I love it. I, I wish, like, to be clear, like, it reviewed really well, aside from, like, again, like, Steam users were pretty um, frustrated with technical issues, and I see some people saying, like, on console they had technical issues. I played it on PC, and I didn't have many. Slow load times at the beginning, but after, when I went back to it, it was fine. Uh, it's fantastic. I love it. I'd be very surprised if it wasn't in my top five by the end of the year. I'm going to play it. That sounds good. You've absolutely sold me on it. I think the only unfortunate thing is that Baldur's Gate 3 is coming out so soon, and yeah. I, um, I've been looking forward to that, so I am going to play that when it comes out. But I think having a game that ticks all those boxes of something that's like co-op, like a really fun experience, um, is it? it's like just like a fantastical world with kind of some... Is it silly writing in some ways? Oh, because yeah. They're, yeah, that's, it, it's... Like my, that's my jam. It is like I'm trying to compare it to something. Fallout is like no country Cohen Brothers compared to this. It makes Fallout seem super serious and up its own ass. It's a uh, again, it's it's jokey to a detriment. Like it's a bit generic. Again, like you've seen these enemies before. You've seen these bosses. Um, but it is funny. It's I, I I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I would recommend it to like. Again, you don't even need to like CRPGs to check it out. If it's on Game Pass, give it a try. It's and I, I'm a, I know I, I think Dan, you and I have talked about this. I don't I know you're not as into inventory management, but I, I can be. I can be. That I love that. Again, you have a party of six people. You're pulling from this pool of like forty at a certain point, and you're like, who do I want to bring on? And I have a guy named Sasquatch who's just this melee focused brass knuckles with spikes. Um, 
someone else is like into this 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 um this trait called weird science. So you have a gun that shoots um, exploding squirrels that do ice damage. It's very weird, okay. uh, but I, yeah, I love it. It's great. Uh, for someone like me that has not really played the genre, is it one that uh, within an hour or two I could kind of get into the swing of it, or is it a slow burn at the beginning? No, it kind of throws you right in. It, it teaches you the combat. Like again, it's not a spoiler. Right at the beginning, you're like things are going south, and you're learning the combat. Um, it takes it takes like an hourish until you get to the base. Once you get to the base, and then you go out, they give you like here are your four main quest branches. Go to these four places: Colorado Springs, the Plains, uh, Boulder. Recruit these people. Recruit your medic. Recruit your cook. You're basically building up your base. But here you are your recruit four. A cook? Yeah, you have a mess hall, you have a prison, you have a, a garage. You have a you prison? Have a, you have a garage, you have everything. It's um, And then, again, you it's this it's this one family you're wearing. It's Dan, you'll love this. The dude, the main dude, his name is the Patriarch. He, like, runs Colorado. He has, like, a Game of Thrones-style chair that he sits in, but it's, instead of swords, it's just a bunch of, like, colorful rockets that are, like, coming out of the chair. Uh, okay. And his, his weapon is this giant hammer, but the front of the hammer is a golden fist, okay. um, and he's the patriarch. And he and it's his his three kids have like absconded and are rebelling against him. And those are your those are like your assassination targets. It's very I'm good so about excited. it's very good about here are your objectives. Uh, go build up your base, but also kill these three people. This one needs to come in alive, no matter what, because I have business to settle with her. She's the smart one. Her brothers are idiots, but they're still going to give you a little bit of trouble. It's it's. Again, it's just straightforward fundamentals of a good like RPG that just happens to be isometric. Um, Honestly, I, I, I think you're kind of selling me on it. I've yeah. never had more. I've uh, Divinity. It's like your quest list is like fucking laundry list or sorry yeah, chore list. It's exhausting. It almost yeah. feels like you're. Uh, it feels like a job sometimes. This sounds like. Yeah. This sounds more like whimsical and kind of joyous. I love the idea of it. I yeah. love the idea. You had me at prison. I like the idea that I'm like creating this tiny world um, with like a cook and oh, like yeah. a, a guard and um, all these different people that I need to survive. I mean, it sounds, actually it sounds like a total escape. Um, it sounds right up my alley. I think you've, like you've sold me on it. Essentially. It's just, it just nails it. the fundamentals. I've never had like more than three major quests in my head at once. It's just very easy to balance. It's digestible. It's, it's fun, but it does not, it's not lacking in depth. It's long. It's like 60 hours to finish. It took me about 52, I think clocked to that. Um, if you, if you start it like divinity, you're in it for the long haul. Um, but again, like even if you take a, a week or two off, you're not going to like forget anything crazy important. You're going to be like, Oh, right. I'm, I'm hunting down his daughter who is like forming this rebellion, but it's, it's good. I'm gonna Honestly, it I think I might check that out. That really does sound pretty cool. Like, especially like tonally. Uh, it, yeah. You know, whenever I hear CRPG, uh, the thing that keeps me away from it is that it sounds like it's, oh, it's going to be 20 hours before I know what I'm doing. It's going to be this giant story about some dragon king that lives in a castle or something. And like, I'm going to have to read a lot. And like, even if there is a lot of reading or whatever, I don't know, tonally, it sounds like it's, kind of lighthearted and jokey and i love fallout so oh I, yeah i for reading wise i wouldn't even say there's a ton i mean there's 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 contextual stuff going on and like this quest givers will give you like just enough context but then you'll be going into like this apartment building and breaking down doors oh i forgot this one person in my party of six has lock picking skills so she gets us in this next door is way too high level to unlock so oh this guy's a rocket launcher just blow open the door for us I love it. You're um, selling yeah, it so hard. You should work for them. This is great. Everything <laughs> it, sounds awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's coming from some great RPG pedigree. Like, Brian Fargo, Bard's Tale, wrote it. Or, like, worked on it. Like, led development on it. It's 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 great. I'd highly recommend it. Hey, Siri, <laughs> remind me to play Wasteland 3. Okay, I'd I recommend know. PC if you can help it. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll do PC. Yeah. I'd re that, was, that would be my preferred. But it is on Game Pass. If you have Game Pass Dan, for PC, do that. I can't do that. Do that. Oh. <laughs> But yeah, that's my number, what, four. Excellent. Uh, do you guys want to do a real quick bathroom break? I would sure. love to take a break um, just to refill my drink. Okay, we'll take a couple minutes here, and we'll be back. Okay. Bye. And we're back. Hi. Hi. So, Nothing talking about games. We all did our, our bathroom business. I peed, I refilled, yeah. I refilled my drink. Oh, yeah? What, what do you got there? Same thing. 
enjoying the bouquet this time around. Is that the same as bouquet? You could say bouquet, I guess. Is it a flower thing? Are flowers involved with wine? The bouquet is the way a wine smells. Uh, wait, so is that what it means with flowers, too? No, a bouquet is an arrangement of flowers. So it's the same spelling and pronunciation, just two totally different meanings. Yeah, I guess they're related somehow, but I don't know how. Okay, good talk. It's probably in the sense that it's like an arrangement, so you're seeing lots of different yeah. pieces that are forming a cohesive whole. Mm -hmm. okay. I've, I've said this before, but my favorite wines smell like permanent markers. Smell like permanent markers. Mike, I promised you I'm going to stop doing the fart sounds, but you can't just put it on the t-ball for me by talking about wine. It's too easy. Oh, wait, you're keep them going. Me. Keep them going. Are we still going? You want to go? Fart? Wait, you want okay. them? I'll do them. Because I yeah, them. put them on. I'll do them. Here you go. Okay, go, go to town. Get them all out. Right. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing there was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. Thank you. Thanks. That was good. But there's a lot of fart jokes in Wasteland 3, if that helps you appreciate it more. Fuck. What do we got there? What, what, what are we looking at? I Is spilled a, a vodka grater? soda on my keyboard from laughing. Oh, I'm, conv I'm convinced water does not fuck up electronics. I've spilled oh. liquid on so much shit, and it's never broken. Shit! Um, I'll say I had, a friend, I had a friend in college who was dating a girl who dropped her iPhone into a beer at a bar and then set her house on fire accidentally because she heard that if you microwave wet electronics, it'll uh, dry it up. So she microwaved oh. her phone and set the, uh, set the kitchen on fire. That's the kind of bitch you like fucking microwaves a gerbil if it gets wet. Jesus Christ. That's I know the time. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Holy hell. Oh, <laughs> I love this keyboard. Uh, is it, is it not working or are you just, is it... I mean, I just don't want it on any of the, I, it's dry, it's dripping out. Do you guys see it? It's like, there's little drips. Oh, geez. I got you, rice. It, it really got in there. I mean, I didn't pour the whole thing on it, but it is dripping out. So it's a concern. It's code orange here. Is it alcohol? There is alcohol in it, yes. Alcohol cleans things, right? Damn. Yeah. I don't think a silicon. This is an electronic. But you use like alcohol wipes on like screens, right? Yeah, do you eat them? Do you Yeah, but screens aren't like them? silicon and actual I actually don't know the technology behind it. I just know screens are different. Would of. you put a wet wipe on your eyeball, Dan? No, it's got chemicals and stuff in there. It's gonna burn my eyeball. But no, my, no, an no. eyeball is not a keyboard. Right? It's an electronic. It has components. You can't get them wet. Eyeballs have components. They got veins and all sorts of stuff. I've got components, and I'm always wet. Oh, my That's the worst God. catchphrase. <laughs> I'm always wet. Horny I see that. If you're a Marvel party. character, that would be your, like, <laughs> I say that to intimidate phrase. people. If, if people want to fuck with me, I'll be like, I'm always wet. Let's do this. <laughs> That's my it scares, it scares off, like, 72% of people. It precedes most of your bar fights I've seen. Totally, yes. <laughs> Mike inspired WAP. <laughs> <laughs> Meg the Stallion uh, and me are drinking buddies. <laughs> the song's about me. He's always wet. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always just absolutely soaking. Not a fan. What? No, we're on number three, I think. I'm like a damp rag. Just do whatever you want with me. <laughs> Be still, my beating heart. Mary, yeah, Mary, we kicked off Twitch. <laughs> We're gonna get you fired from Twitch. Don't tell your bosses. I I like disagree with the mantra of like this site. I feel like people should be able to. It's a soapbox. People should be able to say spicy, disgusting, gross things on it. Similar yeah. to okay. how I don't think liquid actually fucks with electronics. Um, I. I have said some stuff on Knievel that should definitely have gotten me kicked off. I, I've i said this before from our show that I feel like if I ever do, like, infuriate, like, the internet, they can look through the VODs 
of that show and find something to take me down <laughs> because well, the shit that we say, mostly you on that show, are it's nothing. It's nothing like it's nothing unforgivable. It's just definitely more blunt than I think blunt and um, I don't know. It's 2020. If you can't be honest about um, violence and sex, what else is there? No, I'm just kidding. Do you remember when know. you asked me if Marilyn Manson removed his dick so he could suck his ribs? I didn't ask that. Chat did. And then I proceeded. What was the joke after that? I proceeded. To, I was trying to convince chat that I had done that and that it works. <laughs> That's a pretty common dream, uh, apparently, for men. What? Yeah, the... That's what I've read. You know, okay, there's, there's like two. No. No, yeah. Uh, going down on yourself right that's not what you so, said you said sucking your ribs yeah, oh i didn't mean to say that sorry he accidentally like said it in like backwards oh, okay <laughs> oh that's what it was yes um yeah okay that makes more sense yes i've heard fired. that version. thank you will house my goal is to not get fired if that's any consolation <laughs> my Mary. defense will be this <laughs> What's your uh, what's your number three game after Fall Guys and Carry On? Okay, my number three game. Wait, should I recap for people who have gotten in? I feel like there's more people sure. here. Or do, do you want to? Okay, cool. So again, we're doing top five games 2020 each, loose rankings. Uh, we're gonna get more into disappointments oh. and honorable mentions and I uh, game of the generation. I have an idea that we can track it on screen. I didn't want to mess oh, with good. it because there's already too many elements going on in Streamlabs right now. So here, all right, Mike, what's your number five? My number five was Kentucky Route Zero. Okay. Is the marker board your technical solution to this? Uh, check it out. Okay, this should work. Okay, it's pretty high tech. All right, so. Are you going to put that on your face? Oh, on and, my face. Oh, perfectly readable. Per all right, that's not going to work at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's so small. And it I'm going like to ruin my pimple. green screen. <laughs> You're going to rip off a patch of green. I could just say them. <laughs> and my thing's mirrored. Never mind. That's a terrible idea. Just say him with your mouth. Yeah. I mean, he's gotten really good at production, but he's still getting there. <laughs> I got my, a place to go. My okay, my screen is OBS, so I can do a text file. Oh. It would look like ass, but I don't care. Yeah, uh, we, could, we could pull Mike, it up and pull it down. Yeah, Mike. Uh, so, Mike, game KRZ. one is what? KRZ. Kentucky Route Zero. Oh, right. K-R-Z. Okay, and then... My Wasteland 3 was number four. So I guess it's not number one and four, two. It's four, five and four. Okay, and then... It seems... Oh, wait. It's, it's five to three. Well, I can reduce the size, gentlemen. Well, it's not the... This isn't... It's not the size so much. I feel like it's just like momentum is halting. Momentum? We, <laughs> we talked about farts for like 20 minutes. Are there minutes. farts right now? You were okay, well, in War and Peace for 20 minutes. It's not War and Peace. <laughs> that's a Tolstoy game, right? <laughs> that's a, that's, okay. Was I right? That's not, yeah, but that's not what I'm reading. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. Mike really wants to make sure that we're on a tight ship here. So, yeah. uh, no uh, more fun. God. Or if you're on my ship, it would be so tight. If you come Actually, on my ship, you gotta stay tight. Else. It's got, uh, we gotta keep Mary and I watched here. Resident Evil movie, uh, the Paul W. S. Anderson Resident Evil the other night. I've never seen any of them. We watched it another the other night. It's just as dumb as people said, but there's one guy who was like in charge of the squad. The only thing he ever said to was like, "Keep it tight." And then he would someone would wander off to like look at a monster through a window. He'd come up next to him and be like, "I said keep it tight." <laughs> Are there any Steve Frosties? Are there any what? Stay oh, no, frosties? no, no. The, yeah. That's his version of Stay Frosty, and eventually okay. he gets diced by these lasers after doing this sick move. Dan, what was your five? I know your four was Tony Ori. Hawk. Ori. T-S- right. T-H-S-P. <laughs> Tony Hawk. Skater Pro. <laughs> Skater Pro. T S. That works. Thisp. Thisp. And then I, I like mine. how you can only work within your frame. So that all has to just be clustered around you. <laughs> yeah, this is the system. This is what we came up with. Yours was a post-it that was illegible. <laughs> Does anyone else want to go with this idea? Look, Fire Escape is off to a rock and start production-wise. <laughs> God, 
All right. If anything, five he's caused a fire. Mm. Fall guys. Uh, then I add carry on. And then number three. We're back on the ship now. Uh, I'm going to go with Spirit Fairer. Yeah. Uh, you were playing this one time when I uh, raided you, right? Yeah, I've been trying to convince you to play it. Um, there's lots of like lovely elements about this game um, that make it, in my opinion, the next Stardew, um, which is wow. what I wanted Animal Crossing to be. And so where Animal Crossing did not scratch that itch for me, Spirit Fairer has. And now we'll try to attempt to explain why. There are elements of um, growing, so you are kind of farming in it a little bit, but there's so much more to the world. You are quite literally a spirit fairer. What does that mean? It means you're finding people in the world, they're converting into a spirit on your ship, and then you're satisfying their needs so that they can feel comfortable passing over and you know, no longer being a ghost in this world. It's very Casper in that sense there. Does it also have Harris. the Sharon guy, the Sharon Boatman that's in like Rogue Legacy yeah. and Hades and the boat the boatman from the afterlife, Sharon? Yeah, he yeah. ferries people across the river Styx. Yeah, what's yes, up with him being does. all over the games this year? Uh, there's people obsessed with death this year and he's the guy who makes it, it makes the transition for us. Death huh. is in. I would love it's to be the person who carries dead people across. That's not what I meant. Cool. Um, Spirit Fair is good. So Spirit Fair, you uh, you run this ship. You are the Spirit Fair, so you're collecting these souls. They convert into like really cute animals. I think this is important, is that the uh, hand drawn animations really <laughs> help convey what's how happening beautiful to Mike? it is. I no, I'm know. so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm, you didn't interrupt me during my game. Dan called Charon Sharon. So now everybody's saying Sharon the boat. The boat. It's the age. Sharon. 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 No, I'm not. I back off, Prim Reaper. Get away from me, I Sharon. Don't I'm not die, Sharon. Is he from like a Dante's Inferno? Or like, what's the what's the origin? I, I know I'm getting hung up on Sharon. He's from but... he's from Greek mythology. He's one of the Catonic gods who he's the dude who ferries people across the river. He's in like he's in he a lot of. Class... I don't know if they ever use him, but he no, he's everything he's, else. He was in. I mean, he was in the Iliad and everything. Okay. Anyway, I'm so sorry, Mary. I. I couldn't it's hold that okay. in. It's okay. I think it's worth it to talk about Sharon a little bit. Um, this is a, a very heartwarming game because of the way it's delivered. So at the end of the day, it's just about keeping up with all the stuff you have to do. Um, there's farming. Good you're uh, collecting these passengers. You have to build houses for them. So you have to get um, the correct items, whether that's wood or ore, or um, they have their own types of elements like lightning in a bottle. And so you have to collect these pieces that you can give them what they need so they feel satisfied to cross over into the next world. So that's what it is in general sense. But actually, it's like the gameplay that makes it so valuable when you're collecting all these different things, like, for example, lightning in a bottle. Sometimes you'll ride your ship into a lightning storm. And so one of the characters will play a flute. It will cause lightning to hit the ship. And then you have to run around trying to catch it in a bottle. And it's these kind of like whimsical, beautiful and peaceful moments that make this game so such a delight to play that you don't actually feel like you're collecting items so that you can get them to the end. You're enjoying the experience of collecting the lightning because it's really beautiful and it's set to music and it's just like this nice, delightful, pretty, fun moment in time. So I, it keeps constantly doing that to you. Well, maybe, um, you, when can, you're... maybe you can help me out with this because like I, everything I've heard about it sounds great. And I watched you yeah. play for a bit uh, when I raided you when you were playing it. And um, it looks great, but it looks like a Metroidvania to me. And we talked about how, like, you know, I love those games. I don't even know if it actually is a Metroidvania. I could be wrong right away with that but i think you mentioned there, on your is. stream it is i think so yeah because you get a double jump and you get other elements that and then there's certain areas you can't get to without them so yeah okay to, i actually dan to your maybe to your interest i saw it's, uh, several people in reviews compare the actual exploration or at least the structure of the different places you go to wind waker you're going across to mm -hmm. different islands and stuff interesting okay well yeah. the concern i had was I, I think mary on your stream you said that uh, you can't really die and when I think of that genre of Metroidvanias and stuff, like a big part of it for me is, you know, the danger and leveling up and going back to areas stronger. Like, is it, am I just thinking about this the wrong way with this game? Well, no, 
I don't think you are. I think it's a, it's about altering your perception of like what the what this type of game is. You you can't die in this game, but there are certain areas you can't get to or that you can't proceed. This isn't a combat focused game. Um, the elements in which there's like a monster or something like that, you're helping it. Um, uh, so you have to kind of change that idea. In no way will there be like a boss fight in this okay. type of game. This is about collecting items so that you can help people uh, and you're just acquiring goods, essentially. It's much more Stardew Valley than okay. it is a boss fight type Metroidvania. I think that's what um, I got to do is just think of it as a different thing. It's just like seeing like a little bit in motion. I was like, oh, Metroidvania, but it sounds like maybe that's not what this is. No, I wouldn't look at it like that at all. I think you'd actually be quite bored if you looked at it for any kind of combat sequence because you're never actually really fighting anything. There's like these sea monsters that are in the game, but you're helping them because they have like crystals growing on their back. And so you're, you're making, they're giving them ease because they have this like stuff on them and you're collecting it and taking it off. Um, you can get, I wouldn't even say you can get attacked. Like they, you can get like whacked off the the little serpent and you just climb back on. <laughs> it's meant to be really peaceful and easy and there's not really meant to be anything that bothers you in it. Um, it is long. I think that's my only negative to the game is that it's a, it is a long experience. You're just constantly acquiring these materials and you'll see something that requires a triple jump and you'll be like, oh my God, it's going to be like six hours until I play that. But I, I, I encourage you to at least pick it up. And because it's two player co-op, you can play it with a friend. The cat in the game can be played by a second player and they can help you acquire lightning in a bottle and all these other things. And so you can enjoy it with a friend and just have this like very peaceful meditative experience. It's a delight to play like in terms of mental health like it is just it's a lovely game to spend your time on oh and there's a total cooking system you acquire food and then you can put it in a mill so you'll get like you'll grow you'll grow i don't know uh rice and then you'll grind it into rice flour and then you can make a cake it's just so cool to like give one of the people on your ship and they'll say they have just like stardew valley dude the people on your ship will be like, I'm more of a, I, I only like fancy food because I'm a fancy ghost. And then another one will be like, I only like home cooked meals. And then there's someone who only likes sweets. And so you'll, you'll cook up various dishes for them that brings them joy. They actually have a happiness meter and then they do stuff for you if they're really happy and you can hug them. All hand drawn animation. Is this on Switch? Yeah. Yeah. It is? Okay. Yeah. Um, that's where I played it. Okay. It's, this... it, it's, it's Stardew Valley, but you're nomadic. Almost. It's, it's. I'm not. I'm gonna be careful here. I'm not gonna say like it's better. I'm saying it's more complicated and it has like a larger concept than Stardew Valley. Stardew Valley has like certain things that you can do within its world. And this one, you have a ship. You can edit your ship. You're you're adding pieces to your ship. Like you're adding different rooms and houses, and you can decorate it. There's cooking elements. There's fishing. Um, you go to islands and then you investigate the islands. Um, you cut trees. You like. Uh, you know, you take on these serpents, you get lightning in a bottle. There's just a lot more going on. And all of the different places you're going, you decide um, on your own, like Wind Waker. So you'll be, you'll see this global map and you'll be like, I want my ship to go northeast because I've never been to that territory before. So it's very deep and robust. There's a lot to do. And you may have mentioned this, but you're building up your ship. There's like base building aspects too. This sounds like the Definitely. type of game that would be perfect for like flights, you know, once we're like traveling again. It's such a long, it is a long experience. Um, one of the negatives I said earlier is just that it takes a while to get things done. So you have to dedicate hours to it. And I do think that it can probably get a little exhausting thinking like, I don't really know if I wanna play it that long just so I can make uh, fried chicken. But mm. I disagree. I was like, I will play it for six hours cause I got to get to this fried chicken. So I, it hooked me, I got really into it. And I feel strongly that if people are looking for that experience that you know, makes them feel good when they play it. Spirit Fair is the one. Um, also, that game developer is really amazing. Um, I think they're called Thunder Lotus Games, and I've been playing their games for several years, and I think they're tremendous. All their games are hand-drawn animation. Remind me what else they made. They made Jotun. Oh, okay, nice. That which is a Metroidvania, oddly enough. Yes. Uh, and it's uh, it's actually a lot of people were like it's a Dark Souls game that was like right around when it was starting to get annoying to be called games Dark Souls games but um, Jotun was 2015 all hand drawn massive boss fights dope game and they made Sundered a couple years ago correct 
which I didn't love, but it was still gorgeous. I didn't love Sundered either, but I love yeah. I love Spirit Fair. Spirit Fair would have been on my list tonight, but I figured you would you were gonna have it. See, that's what I did. I do that yeah. too. I'll be like, he's got this. I it's awesome. It on my list. Dan, I remember when you got obsessed with Stardew, playing Spirit Fair. I was like, oh man, you'd love this. It really it, the Wind Waker comparison's a bit flimsy, but kind of not really because you are. It is like this ocean you get with different islands that you're going to and gathering stuff. It's it's fantastic. Okay. And it's on Game Pass, a fine subscription from uh, Microsoft. I think we've mentioned two games tonight that were not on Game Pass. Is that Phil Spencer behind you? Yeah, yeah. he's got a he's pointing a grenade launcher at me right now. He's oh always God. around. Yeah, Tony Hawk and what? F what else? Tony Hawk and Kentucky Route Zero are those the only two that are on Game Pass we mentioned tonight? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't even know what's on. Oh, Fall Guys oh Fall not, Guys. right? On, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fall Guys is PS Plus, right? Right. Um, yeah. regardless, but, uh, but yeah, no, Spirit Fair is, Spirit Fair is great. I played it at some of, where did I play it? Was it E3 last year? Was it that long ago when I played it? I was like, oh man, this seems like I need to write this down. It's not that it would, it's not that it wasn't worthy of, it wasn't that I was worried that people wouldn't talk about it when it finally released, but it's like, oh man, this just, uh, I want to play this, but I feel like it's going to get overshadowed. Thankfully it has not. A lot of people have been saying it's, it's awesome. And, um, I know IGN's review was glowing, um, Tom Marks really loved it. Uh, it's good. Nice. Yeah, I just made a note. I, I want to check that out. That and Wasteland 3 are the, the two I really want to check out so far that I haven't. I'm glad we're doing this then. Hopefully other people, just like us, are going to find games and play them for the first time. And yeah. good on you. Yeah. And Mike, what's <clears throat> your commission on Game Pass signups? What's my what? What's your commission on Game Pass signups? It's like 40 cents to the dollar. Okay, a month? Okay, that's good. That's good. Does that make sense? No, because I don't know. I'm not doesn't. a business guy. You and your blonde ales. Um, Dan, I got a business Friday. proposition for you. I'm going to talk to you after this. I'm going to pay you 40 cents on the dollar for every time, for every dollar you pay me, okay? Yes. <laughs> um, I, got, I get a share, I get a tenth of a share of Bethesda every time I mention Game Pass. Oh, excellent. Um, all right, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Dan, what's your number three? My number three... You know, I put something down, but after we were talking about it earlier, I almost want to replace it with something else. But I think you get might have out. I covered, almost like... did that too. That's a vote. Of... I love when this happens. Do I go with the original one? You know what? I'm gonna go with the original one that I said. Um, I did put Animal Crossing at number three, and okay. I was second guessing it earlier because we were talking and like everything I said about how like because we were shitting on it. Did I change your opinion? I mean, the things I said were true about how, like, I did the tournament market thing and kind of ruined it and burnt out faster than I normally do with Animal Crossing. But I will say those first... I, I probably did, like, three solid months of, like, playing constantly and trying to make sure, like, oh, it's the last day of the month. I got to make sure to fill out, get this fish that's going to disappear tomorrow. And honestly, part of the, uh, the joy of this one in particular was I've always loved the franchise, but Bianca had never mm. played any Animal Crossing. And I remember thinking, like, oh, man, I bet she would love this, and we'll get to play together. And uh, sure enough, we played tons of it together. So this one specifically, I have a lot of memories of, like, introducing her to that. And, um, yeah, so that's why probably more so than, well, I'm trying to think. In terms of Animal Crossing, New Leaf might be the best one. Um, but this one, this one's up there. Like, I, I think the additions they made were smart. They could have done better with, like, I don't know if you saw those trailers for, like, fan-made Nintendo Directs about, like, quality of life improvements that would have, like, made it way, way better. Because, um, like, it takes a little too long to craft, things like that. Um, not perfect, but ultimately, I'm just a huge mark for Animal Crossing, and getting to play it with Bianca was, uh, I mean, it was several months of playing it, like, every day, and, like, seeing, like, Bianca's house, you know, build up to this very Aww. elaborate thing. Like, it, it, was, it was super fun. So, even though I burnt out, you know, after a few months, still great, great experience, I think. I think that's valid if that was your experience with it and it brought you that much joy, especially with another person. That kind of doubles the joy, right? Because two people got a lot of love and a lot of good time out of it. I think it validates it being on your list. So I'm glad you added it to it. And there's like some iconic experiences I had with it too. Like I loved going over to a girlfriend's house. Um, Gary Whitta was doing his animal talking show at the time and he invited me on it and I didn't have anything to wear because I don't play the game enough. So I went over to my girlfriend's house and she had a whole closet and she was like, pick it out whatever you want. And it actually felt like 
I was at a friend's house and she was letting me borrow a dress before an important event. Like that's how it felt. And I was like, what do you think about this one? And she was like, do a spin. And I was like, okay. And I like, <laughs> yeah, was using me. the yeah. emotes to live out my life. People got married in Animal Crossing. Yeah. People had runway shows in Animal Crossing. People spent a lot of time being in love with that game. And I think that it, it is a tremendous game. It, it's like worthy of all that praise. Yeah. We on speedrun actually we got Dana. our host we got our host ordained and uh one of my producer's friends and her fiance were stuck in Amsterdam at the beginning of the pandemic and we actually like we 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 married them on speedrun in Animal Crossing. There was no marriage license but we had an ordained minister that did it. But you, did, yeah, did the marriage uh, did the wedding have to be under 8 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could be could be loved it. <laughs> got a bunch of subs um awesome. anyway do you have any screenshots of it this was pre-screenshot function okay this was right before screenshots were a thing gotcha yeah don't get me going <laughs> <laughs> not, not the time <laughs> uh, yeah no I, I loved it and not perfect but uh ultimately i just had a blast with it so it had to go on my list but now Mike, you got to pick up the slack, hopefully, with the one that I would have replaced it with that is now just an honorable mention on mine. I'm trusting you, Mike. Go on, uh, Mike. What's your wait, number three? I, okay, well, are you talking Super Mega Baseball yes. 3? Yes. Oh, I took that off mine because I thought you would <gasps> say it. But no, 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 I'll put it on. I'll put it on happily. That is that is honestly like my number two game of 2020. <laughs> I took it off and I thought Dan would be gushing about it at some point. Um, <laughs> Super Mega Baseball 3. I would, I would honestly say, apart from Rocket League, is the best arcade sports game I've ever played in my life. It's, you, it, it, again, I'm going to be talking about Rocket League a lot because it, your interest in baseball can be absolutely minimal. If you understand the general rule of how you score in baseball, you could still enjoy Super Mega Baseball 3. It is more an arcade game than it is a sports game, arguably. Yeah. It's, just the fu it's just the fundamentals of baseball boiled down and then exploded. It's, it's, but at the same time, it's got so much depth. It's got a season mode. And for those who don't know, but I think people know by now, it's just this super, I'm try, again, it's hard to compare to baseball three. Um, Dan and I did a World Series for charity, and it's just absolutely, oh, NBA Jam. It's up there with NBA Jam. I'll go that far. Dang. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 yeah. It's, the best, it's the best arcade baseball ever, and I'm even including, like, King Griffey Jr. on Super Nintendo, which was, like, yeah. the gold standard for me before that. It feels good to play. It's just so intuitive to control. However, it doesn't sacrifice depth. There's super, you can get so crazy involved with the logo customization, the team names, your character creation, the roster, the salary caps, erasing salary caps, the, the franchise ego mode, mode and all that. Like the, the, the ego gameplay mode, tweaks. difficulty, accessibility or difficulty, whatever you want. Um, multiplayer is just so streamlined. It's, it just like pitching is Good just so choice. fluid and you can get so psychological with your opponent batting same thing it just becomes this i hope there's no farts right now but i, I told you <laughs> hand it's, check hand it's, check no farts super mega baseball 3 is Tell just where we can see him a i'm, I'm kind of jumping the gun because this is that this would actually be in my number two spot but it's it is just it's phenomenal in every way um I, it does so many things well. I'm finding a hard way boiling down the argument for it, but I, I, I recommend that everybody plays it. I, you don't even need to really like baseball, but at the same time, the fact that I do happen to like baseball, the fact that there wasn't baseball at the time when we were playing it just made it all the more enjoyable. It kind of reminded me of what it felt like to be keeping up with a team throughout a season, the highs and the lows. Our World Series, I genuinely... <laughs> the, the games I lost, I would go to bed that night like anxious and yeah. nervous. I was like... I need to really practice and pull it together for this next game. I'm there's just enough for an arcade game. There's just enough skill involved where, I mean, you and I both had game gaps between games where we completely improved. Like, yeah, I remember one game I fucking crushed you. And then the next game I came back and you beat me like 18 to two. And it was just demoralizing. Like, but it's so realistic that I disappointed my father by being bad at sports. And he <laughs> called me and tried to explain them to me. <laughs> yeah Aww. and very realistic <laughs> it's oh my god and it oh oh speaking of it just came out on steam today or no 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 it's on sale on steam oh, today sale. okay it's like it's like it's crazy on sale go play it if if like rocket league got like it hit me in the same way rocket Careful. league did 
Oh, it hit God. me in the same yeah. way Rocket League did, where I don't really follow soccer all that much. I don't follow football, whatever you want to call it, all that much. But this game is just good on its own merits. It just happens to be a baseball game. And real I feel quick, like the you're only selling reason... that really well for what? somebody who got peer pressured into putting it on their list. No, no, no. Yes. I, I thought Dan was going to mention it. That's the only reason I took it off. But it, I, I, I was saying, I mean, I was saying just the other day on, um, or just the other, whenever it was, in Connecticut when I was visiting, I was like, it's probably my number two game after a game I'm sure we'll all talk about at some point. But it's... I thought you were going to say it. Oh, the, God. The only it's... reason oh. I didn't put it on mine was because when I was about to, I thought about it, and I was like, well... It's extremely good, and it's the best Super Mega Baseball, but ultimately, I did really enjoy the first two, and so, like, for me, it's like, I can't just factor in the whole series and everything it did, because it's like, it added new things to, like, franchise mode and things like that that I don't really use that much, so the base game of playing, you know, online against my dad and stuff didn't change all that much, and so that's why I took it off my personal list, but it is oh, the yeah. best one of the three, so if you haven't played one, get it. Yeah, and I, I I never played the first two, so this was like a revelation to me. It was, and yes, I saw a chat saying it, single player is awesome. Um, I actually, a few weeks after we finished the World Series, I started a franchise mode just to see how it plays. I was like, I was playing it regularly. I was, I actually, I was doing it where I scheduled it out as if it was a real season. So I would play a game one night, and even if I really wanted to play more, which I always did, I'd be like, no, the next game's not till Wednesday or whatever. It's, yeah. I got really into it. And, and again, like, you can go so far into, te- uh, like, logo design, team creation, characters. You can get super weird. Also, the game just, like, the game is so confident in its design, and it knows it's a good game that it's not afraid. It doesn't take itself seriously, even though it absolutely could if it wanted to. It's yeah. just fantastic. I love it. Um, yeah. I guess I would. That would be my number three, okay. if, even though it would have been my number two. If you had, I thought you were going to mention it, but wait, it's number wait, th- wait. So when you came into this thing, you was put it, it on down your list? a number? I be, no, because I originally. Okay, here's here's what happened. I was originally going to put it at number two. I like it that much, but I was like Dan's going to mention it. So in the spirit of just talking about more games, I won't put it on the list. But you brought you brought it up because it would have been your number three. So I was like, well, I'll talk about it in my number three slot. I'm still confused, but I'll act like I'm not. <laughs> it makes sense. It's not that complicated. Uh, I mean, we can, I, we can, I have a, I have a number very. Two. Number two. Yeah. Mary, go for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're, we're starting to get at the cream of the crop here. Um, this is a game that we've already discussed but we're going to discuss it again because it's really high on my list. It is Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Mm-hmm. It's so fucking good. It's definitely, in my opinion, um, the best Metroid-style game that came out this year. Um, from story to gameplay to visual design to oral design, everything is really perfected. They smoothed all the edges of the first game, which I also absolutely loved and thought was a slam dunk. But this one (laughs) made everything so, so perfected. I think you guys, if you take the chance to to pick it up, you're going to really fall in love with this character and what they did with this game. And it's, it appeals to everyone because it appeals to people who like good stories, but it also appeals to people who, want a damn good like game a good platformer that's going to challenge you it's not easy um and i i just think it's just really well done also all the little extras i know dan you said you 100 percented it like to 100 percent it it's a lot of time it's a lot of dedication to to spend in that world and i found it super fulfilling um and that's why it's my number two and yep agreed on all points just excellent excellent game blew me away Improvement on the original every way I can imagine. So, yeah, totally get why it would be that high. It's like number two on my need to finish list. I I, I have a hard... I think maybe The Last of Us had come out when I was really starting to get into it or something. Um, But I don't know. I really want to go back to it. Um, You did put that under my name, Mary, just for the record. Get that shit off my fucking list. All right, I'm going (laughs) to remove it. It's a good game. I shouldn't call it shit. Um, Nice. 
That's good. Cool. I'll just fix that. All right. So that's on. That's the first repeat so far. I mean, to again, we are kind of shifting things because just to talk about more games. But that's the first. You felt strong enough to mention it again. I feel like that will happen with at least two more games. Uh, Dan, what is your number two? My number two. Uh, I assume this might be on one of your lists or both. Last of Us Part Two. Okay. I respect this. Tell us why, though. Ah, uh, man, it's. I've talked plenty about how like it really takes a lot for me to get into a story. Typically, like games and narrative, like I, I appreciate when they're done well, but you know that's never been the draw of video games for me. Outside of Metal Gear Solid, the greatest piece of art of all time, but um, this one. <laughs> Like, <laughs> it is the greatest story ever told. Sorry, the greatest story ever told. Also, probably the greatest piece of art of all time. Um, but this one, I know, I, I know some Russians who would beg to differ. <laughs> Tolstoy's Metal Gear Solid. Um, Nabokov's rolling in his grave. No, sure, sorry. that guy. Um, <laughs> Quit talking about these bookmen. Yeah, do that on your Bookman, Twitch. Bookman is a Metal Gear Solid name. If that tells you anything about Metal Gear Solid's importance, Leo. To Leo Bookman Tolstoy. There we go. Um, anyway. But I, even the first one, like, I remember playing the first, like, here's, here's my experience with, like, every Naughty Dog game as I'm playing it. It's, it's just like, mm. oh, my God, this is top of the line. This is, like, setting a new bar in terms of storytelling and visuals and action set pieces and stuff. And then it ends, and I couldn't really tell you. Like, I, I loved it the whole way through, you know. Uh, Naughty Dog games have been, like, number one of the year for several years in the past for me. Um, but then I don't really remember, like, I can't tell you the story of any Uncharted game. I played through every Uncharted probably a couple times each. And, like, ah, there were pirates and gold or something. I don't know. You were underwater at one point. Like, I don't really remember. Like, I think he was with Elena, and then they were, the marriage was on the rocks or something. I don't really remember. Uh, and it's kind of the same thing with the first Last of Us. I remember thinking, like, oh, my God, what a, this is such a great story. so well told. And I thought that, like, the sequel, you know, wasn't needed because the, the first one wrapped up so well. And then the way that, like, they presented the story in this one where it's like, holy shit, the, the events, it does not feel like a tacked on sequel for a sequel's sake. It feels like the way the first game ended is so critical to the way they present the perspectives and story of the second one. And it's such a weird, bold thing they did. Um, I don't know if we should go full on spoiler here. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, I would probably, maybe not full on, I guess like... I to that point, to build off that really quick, I would say I was super with you. I, I still like The Last of Us Part 1 more. Um, that's one of my favorite games. Like, a lot of people, I'm sure, would say that. But Last of Us Part 2, I didn't think was needed. But the fact that they really... They took the ending of 1, which I guess we could... They, we could probably spoil that. That's it has been out since two. Ending one, I say, yeah, but no, no story spoilers yeah, yeah. for 2. They, they took the lie Joel told at the end, and... The, Throughout the whole of part two, they were exploring the implications of that and how much it really... Because I, I have to admit, and people will probably like crucify me for this, I actually probably, in Joel's shoes, would have done the same thing at the end of one. Maybe that makes me a terrible person. I, I know that's not the right thing to do, and who knows what I would do in the, his spot, but I think I would... If I grew to love someone that much, I don't know that I would... I would want to think of humanity first, <laughs> but like... Who knows what I would do in his shoes. I like the fact that they take that thought line and like, here's how fucked up that would have been. And they show you what happens in part two. And it totally justified its existence where I didn't think they needed it to begin with. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, and, you know, I knew it was going to be exceptionally well made considering it's Naughty Dog. But uh, I did not expect to be so invested in the story. And they introduce a lot of new characters. And they really, there's just a lot of nuance to how they approach the way characters deal with the the decision from the first game um i was just way more into it uh, in terms of like just the storytelling and everything i did not expect to get that wrapped up in it. and then of course you've got all the like mm -hmm. it's a hell of a stealth game i mean i love the way that well that's the thing it's not even really a stealth game it can be an action game it can be a mix i would go into every one of those encounters like okay i'm gonna be sneaky i'm gonna listen and all this stuff and it works really well while you're doing stealth and you're taking people out from behind and stuff but then the second shit hits the fan and someone calls you out it's like, okay, it just seamlessly shifts into that action game, and it's excellent at that, too. So, I mean, it really just grabbed me in, in every way. I loved it. Yeah, it is a tremendous story, and I, I remember how much the first one really grabbed 
people in unison, like the whole world reacted to The Last of Us as this just incredible journey of a character where you're watching them make a controversial decision, but the amount of empathy you have for Joel at the end doesn't really waver. Even if you disagree with what he does, you understand why. And that's a triumph of a video game to do that, to put you in the shoes of someone doing something so difficult. Um, I've never actually seen a video game do it like that before. Yeah. And so that's why this was such a hyped and beloved sequel. Did it do it again in the same degree? I think it still gives you the ability to empathize with those characters to an incredible degree. That's something that The Last of Us gets to kind of carry with it forever. Um, it's unfortunate it kind of came out at a time where I wasn't super stoked to murder lots and lots of people so viscerally and like massacre dogs and stuff. I'll do it, but I'm not always in the mood for it right now. And I found myself actually watching people play it on Twitch more than I played it myself, just because it was such a draining experience. Oh, it's it's grim. It's grim as hell. And like it's fucking exhausting. It, yeah, it's it's a dark ass game for sure. Like no question about that. Um, the farther we get from it, I found that I finished it and I thought it was a great game. I think it's a great game. I still, I, I like the first one for other reasons we could get to, but I, I think honestly, even not playing it by the end of the year, I might appreciate it more because despite thinking it's a great game, but then thinking, okay, you know what? I didn't really love it. It's the game I think about the most and I don't really think back on games like unless i'm playing a game every day i haven't i think it is the game this year that i've thought about the most in its wake and i found that a lot of the divide between people in that game at least narratively came from whether you think the game was trying to teach you something or push a specific idea on you which i did not I thought they were trying to present these characters and show how fucked up they had become in this really fucked up world. This character who knew nothing else besides this world. I saw, I, I saw people saying that... I mean, I won't spoil anything, the decisions, but I saw people saying Ellie wouldn't have done this or wouldn't have done that. Or I was like, this whole post-apocalypse in which all she witnessed as a fucking, like, what? teenager Child. queen yeah. Yeah. was violence and looking out for your own like this tribalism and this just absolute survive at all costs like is it really that out of character for her to do these things obviously you can go into some minutia and say she wouldn't have done this or why is she doing this this clearly is the right choice but like i i saw that a lot of people that really dislike the story and i'm not saying they're wrong and i'm not saying this is the only reason you would dislike the story but a lot of people found that the game was pushing a specific idea on you. I didn't feel like it was trying to be all that didactic. I thought it was just kind of presenting this cast of characters and showing how fucked up the, the dangers of tribalism are and the dangers of, like, I do, I do think structurally the game was too long. Um, I think a, a specific section, or I think, like, the back half was a bit self-indulgent on Naughty Dog's part. I get what they were going for, and I think it ultimately worked, but I think they could have shaved, like, six hours off of it. That's, that's ultimately my biggest complaint, is that, like, I was getting so into the story and wanted to see where it went in that back half, and I feel like there are so many times where it's, like, momentum, and then it fades out, and it's like, oh, we're doing another flashback. Okay, I guess I'm going to walk through this aquarium for a little bit, and it's just like, I wanted to keep that momentum going, and I feel like they did so many flashbacks. And, like, some of them were very, very effective, mm -hmm. but I think they could have cut out, like, half of them. And, and yeah, and the thing, it, it, the structure becomes kind of um, predictable at a certain point. But again, the thing that like a lot of people are like, oh, th this, this choice was out of character. I'm like, even in a normal world, not that like we're in a normal world, but like even in reality, how many people do you know that are consistent through everything they do and all the choices they make and all the decisions they make? Most people in my life, including myself, will just have these, will do completely out of left field things. Like, not every nobody's consistent. I want I mean, you to jump into trash I'm like, cans. Yeah, I'm like I'm an extreme example of that. But like, I I just think especially in that world, it's like it makes sense for people to just kind of like do these crazy things out of nowhere. But like, the the, the only thing I I I think the level design and some people in the chat were mentioning um 
jazz we're talking about the combat it's very improvised it's very um jake decker at GameSpot spot did it explain it really well once but basically he summed it up as it's you're scrappy you're just taking yeah. any item you can find it's like you get in a brawl and you're looking for the nearest brick or this base like anything nearby they can use as a weapon the first game did it but two did it even better it's like mm. okay i'm doing stealth i'm not trying to stealth it in like a an exhaustive 100 percent way like metal gear solid or splinter cell i'm stealthing i'm trying to kill as many people before the rest of their gang notices me so i have that many fewer people to kill later on and then i just happen to have these scissor blades and it, it felt like violent jazz that just kind of sprung up out of nowhere and the level design was just my fantastic. favorite genre of music is violent jazz <laughs> you should listen when you get the chance but On spotify yeah it it's is just the level design is fantastic i will say that seattle itself got old quick they that the game um the first game i love because of its cross-country aspect it's four seasons across like boston pittsburgh iowa salt lake city etc the it was more varied in terms of its scenery but yeah. um this one obviously was a bigger cast in a more focused location you're not in seattle the whole time but you're there often um but man, the level design was just fantastic. I felt like the way it flowed from scavenging and exploration into combat, into obviously like Naughty Dog knows what they're doing with these cinematic cutscenes. It just, it all worked like as a, a whole. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I thought it was undoubtedly a great game. I, I had a lot of problems with it, just like from a design perspective, but I like, I, I almost like it more for its jagged edges where the first game was just like, yeah, it's just, it's almost flawless. It's not, but like, it, I don't know. It gave me a feeling I've never experienced in a game before, which is like, you know, I'm just kind of done my action guy, Dan, and so, like, you know, when I encounter, like, a big fight or a boss or something in a game, I don't typically put a whole lot of thought into it. I'm just like, all right, let's make the health bar go down. I hope Dante can kill this Cerberus. You know, I, but this this game, there there was a part particularly where they pitch you against another character, and I felt like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to... I don't want to... Can I not? Like, is this an option? You know, like... I was yeah, actually wrapped they, like, up in those characters so much. They, like, force you to kill the dog after you have, like, a cutscene of enjoying the dog. And I think, like, that's a bit gratuitous and um, sucks me out a little bit because they're getting you to be connected to a character before... Not, a, not really a character, but, um, yeah, a character before they make you murder it to death. And I think that that's a mood it's not like you can't do that i just didn't feel like it sure sure <laughs> I, just didn't, I didn't wanna sure yeah and it, it's i do think sometimes they went too hard with like oh it's gritty it's violent it's i was like yeah i get it just like but i i don't know it, it i again i do think it was a bit too long but it was uh it was really too long but man i like that game a lot i thought it was great yeah. Sounds like we're all in agreement of that. I think we should uh, move on to Mikey's two. All right. So I had to kick one off my list because, like I was saying, but here, okay, here's the thing. Second time, this will be on my whatever January list. Um, second time ever, I'm putting a VR game in my top five. Astrobot yeah. Re Rescue Mission was the first. Yes. No, no, no. I'm so sorry. Astrobot Rescue Mission and Tetris Effect. But oh. Tetris Effect, I played on. Uh, I did not play in VR, so I'm counting Astro about the first one. Half-Life Alex is my number two this year. Um, or I guess it's my number two now. Half-Life Alex is the second best Half-Life game. I don't even care that it's VR. I, I, I really don't care. It, it's Half-Life 2, the, for the bait, not the episode one or two. Uh, and then Half-Life Alex. It's just fantastic. It's the, the VR. I can get to the VR aspect, but as a Half-Life fan and a shooter fan, uh, and like games like Metro that really kind of marry narrative and shooters, I picked up uh, Alex not really expecting much, despite the glowing reviews. And I played it, and I finally finished it recently. It took me a while because I had other stuff going on, but finally came back and I got this, again, I, I got my own VR this year for the first time, and Alex just utterly absorbed me. Which is weird because the world of Half-Life is very dreary and kind of, again, it's just like this dystopia. It's not an inviting place, but I just loved being there. And the combat, the, the weapons, the puzzles in the game, the 
the sense of place that it imparted, but also just, I love the characters. It was genuinely funny. Ah, oh, fuck, what's his name? The dude that's in your ear the whole time, the dude from New Zealand. I forget his name. It's absolutely, it, it was it was my game of the year for a, for a while, and, and I hadn't even finished it until um, my game of the year came along for so far. But Half-Life Alex, just, I... I love it. It's so well paced. It's I found it to be well paced up there with like Half Life. It goes from a puzzle to just kind of exploration, story heavy. Uh, and then it goes to a combat scene, which of course is VR, so you could be ducking and shooting and like throwing these grenades back at guys with the gravity. Uh, the I forget what are they, I think the gravity gloves or whatever they're called. The uh, the gloves that can pick up things from a while away are yeah. such a great are such a good workaround to VR's limitations that I can't believe no one thought of it before. Maybe they had in some smaller game, but like uh, grabbing a grenade in midair with these telekinesis gloves, throwing it back, fighting these armored guys and just shooting their face six times with this gun and then reloading it, uh, fucking dropping the magazine on the ground and being like, oh shit, I still had three rounds left in that. Picking it back up and putting it back in your gun and killing him with one of those last three bullets. Uh, the level design is fantastic, which is so weird to say in VR because VR, I feel like I've never really actually cared about level design in VR because... VR has been so proof of concept up until then. And that, that's not the first time it hasn't been. There, again, there are other games. Astrobot did a great job. But as far as first-person shooters go, it was so secondary to me that it was a VR game. It was just a fantastic Half-Life game. It was a fantastic Valve game, which is just saying a lot to me. Um, I Half-Life Alex is just such a... It was masterful to me. And, I, and the fact that it's VR just exacerbates it rather than kind of hindering it to me. I maybe I need to give it another shot because I've got a quest and I got the link. I bought the link cable just so I could play Alex on it. And Same here. Yeah. It. Uh, I like Half Life a lot. Um, I think it's great. And I played. I feel like an hour and a half, two hours. I remember it took a long time to get the gun, and I was just kind of bored until then. And like, I don't know if I was just frustrated because like, I I have a quest and I still I never use it. I I was so excited about VR and I've been waiting for like that big VR killer app that's going to be like, ah, finally somebody made that game. And I thought it was going to be this. And it just like, it did nothing for me in those first couple hours. And I don't know if part of it was like, I still, even though it was on the quest with like a tiny link cable, if I was too aware of like, uh, every time I step one direction this way, the, the guardian shows up because I'm getting close to my couch or my TV or something. Like, I don't know if maybe I played it in a parking garage or something. Maybe I'd get more into it. Um, or maybe I just didn't get far enough. You know, I barely even got to, like, having a gun. But I was really excited for it, and I played a bit, and I just fell right... I, I only played it that one session and never thought to pick it back up again, so... I, I do mean, I do think it, it grows on you, Dan. I had a, a mediocre opening to that game. I think a lot of it is um, you are kind of sent for a loop when you have your expectations of what a half-life game is supposed to be and going through the rudimentary experiences of being like oh right now i have to really like remember how to move and i'm going to jump to a very particular location and yeah they have like some kitschy things where you can write on a whiteboard this is neat and it's advanced but is it half-life and is it the experience i want and at first that was my reaction as well, which is like, oh, cool. They made a really dope VR demo and they made it a Half-Life themed demo. Um, that's where it began, began for me. And then as you continue to play it, it becomes a really incredible game. Huh. And it really is. But it does take, there's, um, there's some levels, I would say six hours in, that really start to push the boundaries, not only of VR, but game design. And then there is some boss fights right after that, that I would say start to really alter what you think the future of video games are. Um, and what's really cool about that is Valve has always said that Half-Life Half was kind of their playground. And that's why everybody like raves about Half-Life 2, right? Is because it, it really did things that games weren't considering doing at that time. And I think that that's what people will perceive Half-Life Alex in the future. They'll say, damn, this is a really great and amazing experience, but Half-Life Alex did it first. They are the Simpsons of video games. They will always do it first because they were tinkering with these concepts and they did it successfully. 
I, I got to get back in there, especially if I'm yeah. I'm going to get the Quest 2. I, I saw you had some crazy thing. I, I raided you once, and you were in VR, and you could see the chat. Like, you pulled, like, your hand up or something? Yeah. How the hell does that work? I streamed most of my experience with Half-Life Alex, and it I can show you how to do it. It was really neat. Um, but, yeah, you can get chat in your wrist so that when you move your hand a very particular way, chat will appear. That's so um, cool. And that was really fun, too, because when I would make a mistake um, – uh, Mike was saying it's really stressful when you uh, have a like a crab coming at you and you're just like ah, and you're like trying to get your bullets in your gun. Reloading oh, yeah. is never an issue in Half Life, but like all of a sudden, like reloading is your oh. goddamn lifeline. And I'm leaning back <laughs> physically and trying to reload my gun, and I'm freaking out and shooting in, in VR. It's just a tremendous experience for people to witness. I have, I would say, over 60% of the game um, on, on like my Twitch, and it was just, what a fucking ride, dude. Like, it's, it's like a movie. It's like better than going to Universal Studios, man. And you can't right now. So cancel that trip because it's a waste and you'll get Corona. Just play Half-Life Alex. Go Good get your choice. VR set. You'll have a way better time and you won't get a disease. I, the last, I feel like, like I the must... last four hours, the last four hours of that game are just nonstop fucking adrenaline rush. And again, like you, you don't forget that you're in VR. And I will say like, I, I, I totally agree with Mary that it does take a while to get going. And I generally get really annoyed when people tell me that, like if I dislike something and someone says, no, just if, if you dislike this, if you didn't like season one of this TV show, just wait until season three. I'm like, if something's good, it should probably grab me within yeah. the first whatever yeah. hours. I do think here I kind of, I know that's, I, that's a generalization. It doesn't always have to be that, but it's like, I think here they had the challenge of knowing that it would draw all these new people to VR. And I do think the early stages of this game are still very like VR tutorial-y. Yeah. Once they get past that and it's really just Valve fucking firing in all cylinders, you you notice it and you're just along. It's like a fucking tour de force, like this cliche, like movie critic quote. It's like you'll walk into a room and see the way they introduce stuff is just so like Mario levelly. the way that they like introduce these certain aspects at a time. It's like, okay, I understand this. And then you, I, okay, I see, I see this, um, the tongue from the ceiling grabbing this explosive barrel. I can shoot this to blow them up. I get that. That's new or that's not new. That's half life. I go into this next room. There's a few more barrels, but they also, apparently there's gas in the air. Uh, but now they're the head crab zombies coming at me. So I need to be a little more careful of, I can't use grenades um then the next room it's like holy shit there are these two explosive barrels getting pulled up to the ceiling that are gonna blow up but at the same time there's six guys jumping at me uh but also there's a head crab somewhere behind me and it's actually behind me and i need to work on my movement it feels like an actual good it feels like the frantic violent jazz of a shooter <laughs> but in vr and it's just it's and again the, the pacing just throughout it once you there are a few puzzles that i felt were a bit um opaque to kind of were a hitch for me in the pacing but again the last like four hours i there's one specific location i'll say the north star once you hit there and then go after that it, the game just gets phenomenal um it's a good shooter it's a fantastic half-life it's a fantastic valve game um it just happens to be an awesome vr game as well um it, it's tough to talk about without spoiling but yeah i will say well that said. yeah the, the last the last several hours are just so well paced and just they understand how to play with you in a in a really impactful way god i feel like um, i got like three games at least just from this conversation so far that i like need to write them down i gotta play it that's, worry more that's why we do these lists it's so that we find things that we didn't know and to secretly judge each other oh yeah oh yeah Definitely. uh I feel like honorable mentions are gonna. I have a bunch I want to talk about, but okay. Um, can oh, I? I don't. I don't. I don't. I just want to go refill my drink. Can I'll, you guys I'll pee. Yeah. I'll do a little pee break here, right. and we'll, then we'll do let's do honorable mentions, and then do our number ones. Oh, you want to do honorable mentions first? This is like kind of rapid fire. Do our honorable mentions, and then we'll talk okay, about right. our number cool. one. Great. All right. Uh, I will hit Sweet. the break cam here. We will be back uh, very soon, and we're back. Hello, everyone. 
All right. So for Dan's suggestion, which makes which makes sense, we I have the whole list of 2020 games. Um, we I might I, I we should run through like honorable mentions and talk about a few. Like I have one that I really want to talk about that isn't technically my number five, but we can run through a bunch. I, I we can kind of like rapid fire. I don't know that we need to like go too deep into each of these, but um. We'll no. save the number ones for a little bit, but I can keep going around the... Do, I, do we even need to go around the horn? Because I don't even know if we have really these like locked and loaded and ready. Yell them out. I, just, I just have the whole list. Yeah, just, just yell uh, things. I don't know. Uh, but one of you. Dan, what's what's like one that you really would like to talk about that you didn't list on your top five or we didn't talk about? And uh, to be clear, this could be one of our number ones. We don't know. We have not discussed this previously. Well, the ones I mentioned, uh, you know, Maneater, Fall Guys, Super Mega Baseball 3, they're all up there. Um, there's stuff like Mario 3D All-Stars and Command & Conquer Remastered, which is, like, awesome versions. Well, you know, it's pretty much the same version with Mario um, of games that I love, but I'm, I'd rather do new stuff for a list like this. Um, there are a couple I'd like to say real quick. Spelunky 2. I am loving Spelunky 2. That said, I'm not deep enough into it yet, and I'll just say another game of maybe its genre kind of stole its thunder, uh, which I'm deeply into right now and so spelunky has kind of fallen by the wayside uh the other one ghost of tsushima i i loved ghost of tsushima i got a little bit into the second island and um i just fell off completely um just it it got a little harder the combat and stuff which i appreciate but ultimately that loop was kind of wearing on me or or I was getting less enthralled with it as I went on, and the story wasn't doing a lot for me. So ultimately, I, I kind of fell off of Ghost of Tsushima. I don't know if I'm going to come back to it. But worth an honorable mention because I really did like it for a while. Tsushima is... That is one of my honorable mentions. Um, I Tsushima? Ghost of Tsushima. Oh. <laughs> what did you think I was talking about? Oh, just a sushi. Yeah, you said Sushi Ma. Sushi Striker on Switch. Yeah. Sushi Mama. Um, actually, oddly enough, we interviewed <laughs> some of the devs for Speedrun, and the transcription service thought we said Sushi Mama. <laughs> um, but yeah, Ghost of Tsushima was fantastic. I, okay, at first, when I first played it, I was like, I, I stand by the fact I think it's a very solid game. I don't think it's I think it's better than average for sure. I think the combat's fun. I think a lot of the side stuff. It feels like an open world game from like 2014. Sure, yeah. But I really liked it because of that. And I felt like that was the exact kind of game I needed. Just it was like a checklist. It was a lot of stuff like not that I wasn't contributing to it and I think the setting was great. It felt like an earlier Assassin's Creed game set in feudal Japan. Yeah. And I loved that. I liked it because I, I don't like Assassin's Creed and a lot of the time playing this I remember thinking like, "Oh, this feels like a good Assassin's Creed game." You know, mm. yeah, and it, it, it's it is too long. I, I the first island could have been its own game, I would say. Um, but I but you liked it, and it's I liked a, it. It's it almost yeah. made you top five. Eh, I I thought it was an honorable. <laughs> I just I just think it was it's a it's a good game. Um, uh, my other my my number one honorable mention. XCOM mm. Chimera Squad. Mm. Um, Aww, I can't believe XCOM wasn't your number one. It'll absolutely be like, it might move up. It honestly, again, the whole Super Mega Baseball debacle kind of threw me off. But um, XCOM Chimera Squad, I absolutely love what they did with that because it was it very much was this like spinoff to XCOM. But what they did was like they took this, you know, like you have 11 people you can pick from. It's all close quarters combat. Um, also, the interweave turns, um, for those who don't know, XCOM 1 and 2 you your squad takes their turns and then the enemies all take their turns and then your squad XCOM camera squad introduced what they called interweave turns where it would be more based on initiative and speed where these two would go and then one enemy would go and then these two would go and you can fuck with that and a big part of the game is like deciding when to spend these uh abilities that give a teammate action points that give bring them farther in the order but it also just had this really good 70s like 70s like detective vibe movie kind of like lethal weapon style um campy uh, like crime epic kind of like tone to it that really worked and also just using aliens 11 ha taking away the um procedural characters which is such a huge part of XCOM to me and the permadeath um which you can't have permadeath you 
you do have permadeath in this game if you fuck up enough, but having this set cast, I was really worried about, but I actually really liked it. It was a good change of pace. I love it. It's just, again, fundamentals are there. It introduced um, the breach mode, the interweave turns. I, I think it was a very good proof of concept for certain systems that will, I would be very surprised if they did not make their way into XCOM 3. And for those who might be new to this, I, I talk about XCOM every day of my life and I love it. So Chimera Squad is uh, my number one honorable mention. Nice. Um, I'm going to talk about The Last Campfire. Hello, games. Hello. This isn't what you make. Uh, Last Campfire was a, a very cute um, puzzle adventure game made by Hello Games. Um, they completely made this out of nowhere. This is, I would say, possibly comparable to... It is not fair because if I say this, you'll be like, this isn't like what you said, but I compare it to a Zelda in the sense that you acquire a skill and then you utilize it in puzzles like a dungeon. Um, it's extraordinarily cute. It's very fun to play and it's very whimsical. It has, I would say it's a little too easy, which is why it just didn't make my top five, but holy cow, it's really good. And it's on the Switch, so you get to play it actually by a campfire, which is what I did. And I do recommend it. So please at least look up the trailer. I like strongly recommend that the, uh, oop, the last games, the last campfire is a really good game. Um, I'm putting other ones on here that didn't come out this year, but I have a reason. I have multiple reasons why I can justify this. One, these are honorable mentions, so they don't have to abide by traditional rules. And two, they had content that released in 2020 that in many ways make it like it came out this year because I would never have played it without this content. I don't think I'd even heard of this. Last Campfire was really good. It is, um, it, you'd, you'd be blown away that it was a Hello Games game. Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't connect to you. Look, it doesn't like, look anything like what they make. Isn't that Joe Danger in No Man's Sky? Same guys? Yes, it's yeah. No Man's Sky. It's the developers who made No Man's Sky, and they made this game. And it's a, you're a cute little you. You look like a little fox in a in a sweater. It's huh. just so cute, and everything's so cute about it. And you interact with these little characters who are like, I don't have the right ingredient for my soup, and you're like, I'm gonna go get a tomato from this fucking puzzle. And all the puzzles are like pretty interesting. Some of them are a little weak sauce, but you enjoy it. You enjoy your experience. I was super close to putting this in my top five. It's very cute. Um, Games that released content this year that I felt so strongly about that I had to put on here. Raft. Raft is fucking dope. You're on a raft. There's a shark attacking your raft. You have to constantly make different materials in order to build a bigger raft and defend the shark. But then eventually you actually uh, build shit that help you get to incredible areas like islands. And then you uncover fucking maps and you start treasure hunting. It's outrageous how deep this game gets for how simple it starts. And you can play with, I think, like lots of other friends online. I played this with friends. Like I played this with people in Australia, which is insane. And we had a really good connection. And we were like, I was painting the ship while they were like, uh, getting fish and we were like uh, shaking trees to their coconuts. It's a dope game. You really should check out Raft. It's come a long way. It was early access. It still isn't early access. So it's not there yet, but it's fucking good. It's so good. And I got lost in that game. Please, please check out Raft. Um, Outward. This is Dark Souls, but with a friend. So you get to like go on these wild adventures and you have to remember to have all of your different you have to have the right shoes on and the right hat and you got to like make sure that you got your like sauce and you got to have your uh, tent so that you can go to sleep if you get hurt. And then you go and do like a crazy raid and figure it out. It's got a hell of a hard uh, introductory when you have to like get through this intro section. But once you get through that, you basically are just going on a wild adventure with a buddy. And Outward is just tremendous. So tremendous, like uh, Outward and Raft, they technically came out like two years ago, but they released updates this year that I think are worth talking about. Okay, I, I'd heard of Raft before, and I was curious about it. Like, just from the like Steam page, I thought it was going to be one of those uh, uh, survival, you got a rock and a stick type things mixed with some yeah. Minecraft stuff. Is it one of those? Yeah, it starts out with that. Like, so like the first thing you do is you're uh, you have to maintain your health, right? So you need food and water. So uh, there's a you you have this basic items. You'll maybe like grab some 
shit from the ocean, <laughs> trash really, and you make yourself uh, something that will help you clean water so you can drink. And then you'll uh, make a harpoon so that you can uh, kill a fish and then you'll eat it raw. But then eventually you'll be like, let's make um, like a rudimentary fire. And so you'll be able to get the building blocks to have your first like shitty oven. And eventually over time, it expands so much beyond that. But yes, there's day and night cycles. You get tired, you have to go to sleep. You have to maintain your health. If you get hurt, you have to like take a rest. Um, drinking does become an issue later, but then like they add so much cool stuff to it where like certain meals um, keep you full for longer or give you like a damage bonus or extra defense. And then you're making these like crazy weapons by the end of it. You're like constructing helmets out of the various animals that you find. And you're like, it's very like, you're like running around with a little pitchfork wearing like a fucking shark head, running around with your friends being like, I found a coconut back here. Like, let's all go get it. And you're all running around. It's like, it's just a whimsical adventure. It does, it's, it's really wild and I, I, I don't want anyone to look it up because the exciting thing is that you didn't think that this game would include certain items and then when you see them in the game everyone gets excited so I, okay. I wouldn't recommend looking up too much about it if that's your jam uh, find a friend and jump into raft and just dink around with it for three hours I think you'll have a good time okay yeah yeah I'm curious um, Dan anything else big you want to mention honorable mention wise that's my big ones. Um, okay, before we get to number ones, an apology. Uh, we don't have to like go deep into any of these. Um, apologies if I touch on one of your number ones, but uh, so we talked about The Last of Us, Ghost of Shima. Um, Neo 2, I still have yet to play, and I love Neo 1. Neo 2 apparently is even harder and like more in-depth. That's like number one on, that is number one on my next to play list. Uh, very um, souls borny. If you played Neo 1, uh, the first Neo, uh, more inspired by Japanese mythology and yokai and shit like that. Um, I want to really play that. Um, Gears Tactics, mm. which I really enjoyed way too long, far too long. Also had a very big fundamental problem that they do not, maybe they've updated it, but it fucked me over because they tell you, you can enable permadeath mode, and I am always going to enable permadeath if I have the option. I usually like it. I think it's really an effective gameplay system. But they say if, if a hero dies in, in the normal mode, if one of the main... That game does not... It didn't really understand how to balance between these procedural soldiers you picked up along the way and the actual cast members that are integral to the plot. It's trying to tell a traditional five-act gear story with this cast of four characters. And if any one of them dies on the permadeath mode, you start the game over and they wipe your save, and they don't fully illustrate the dangers of that. And that happened to me, and I got to the third act, and you can't have one of these cast members die. And they told me that, but I just assumed that it would restart the mission, but no, they wipe your save. Uh, I think, I just don't think, XCOM Chimera Squad is such a good example of how to use scripted characters in a game like that. Gears does not really, it didn't balance that well for me. However, that game super impressive how they translated gears into a turn-based tactical top-down game especially in the way that as opposed to XCOM they it really encourage you to be aggressive you get extra action points if you chainsaw someone uh you don't want to just stay in cover because the animal enemy will flank you you want to be fragging people you want to be using your sniper to get killed as often as possible you need to be aggressive the best defense is a good offense they were really good about that um it just—it felt like they—they they literally just moved the camera up in a Gears game. Um, it's good. It, I thought that was a good game that was way too long, and it had that fundamental flaw where it's like they don't know how to balance. They tried telling a traditional Gears story, which does not work in this kind of genre. Um, that was up there. Crusader Kings Three for me. I love it. Um, I just have not played enough of it. I've only played like eight hours, which is nothing for that game. Um, and as far as being a as far as like leading a holy war where you're trying to fuck the pope and that starts this whole like incestuous um clan this this whole incestuous war with all these other people and you're trying to pit this per this this lord against this I'm other i'm gonna one stop you at fuck the pope yeah. you're telling me that there's a plot where you fuck the pope you can try yeah you can try to like uh romance like these religious leaders and then that can start a war and oh, then i thought you misspoke you, no. you meant what you said. Okay. I meant exactly what I said. I never misspeak ever. And 
<laughs> um, and you can like this. Oh, this one lord is an alcoholic, and people are trying to exploit that. But you might not think that's a cool thing to do. So you're you're spreading rumors in this court about this person. It's just all this intrigue, and there's so many systems layered on top of systems that I do not feel comfortable speaking to the game as a whole. I have a feeling I will like it a lot the more I play it. I love the other two, uh, or I love the earlier games, but um, it's great. It, it's great, but I. I have not played enough of it to really speak intelligently about it clearly. Um, cool. What else? I'm going to say Resident Evil 3. We talked about it as a disappointment. I think it really was close for me to put on my list. I enjoyed every minute I had with it. It was a brief amount of minutes, but I really enjoyed it. The nemesis was as scary as I remember him to be. And uh, we had a really fun time playing it, Mike. And so I, I love that game. I think it's great. And then my last big honorable mention deep rock galactic i this will be in my top 10 at the end of the year uh really quick elevator pitch and I'll, we can move on but I've been, this is by my main co-op game for the year i'd say it is you're it's a team of four you go into these you drop into these quick fire missions almost like a destiny or a warframe um but there's this minecraft element where you can dig through anything but there are these four classes or these dwarves you're trying to gather Good these specific choice. materials fight this one boss every once in a while these bugs will swarm you um, very tight combat. The classes are well designed. There's a lot of progression. Um, it's almost like Vermintide or Left 4 Dead meets Minecraft meets Destiny, but in this, your fantasy dwarves in outer space. Uh, also, a very colorful game. It's fantastic. Uh, I, I I like the game a lot. That's my. That's also an honorable mention for me. But um. But you can't fuck the Pope. No, I tried. I try that in every game. Um, every, there's a Twitter account. Can you fuck the Pope? Uh, so I, and then um, in the game, they cool. made it after so, the one about petting the dog. I have yet to finish Final Fantasy VII Remake. I can't speak to that game. I think the combat's great. I don't have any love for the first game. I've never played it. I understand a lot of people like it. Deep Pope Galactic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Mike, Mike, I'm with you on Final Fantasy. I got to the very end of that because I liked the combat system, and I kept waiting for it to like kind of evolve and get better and stuff, and it didn't really. And then Bianca had played through the whole thing, and I asked her at one point, I was like, how close am I to the end? And she was like, you only have like four hours left. And I was like, honestly, I'm so, I've been burnt out on this for the last ten hours. I will end four hours before the end of this giant game just because I don't want to play the rest of it. And then I looked it up. And because I heard it does some, like, wild, crazy things with the plot. And, like, look, I've got some nostalgia for the original, but ultimately not a huge Final Fantasy guy. And I read about what the thing was, and I won't spoil it, but it's just like, dude, this feels like this must be for, like, hardcore Final Fantasy people. Because, like, I don't even know what the fuck they're talking about here. This is not for me at all. Yeah, I thought the combat was super, super tight, super well designed. Uh, I like the Tifa, especially, was was fun to play. Uh, and I love the world. I like I like... I haven't. What, I'm at like the second Mako reactor, if that means anything. Uh, I'm not super far in, but I have no desire to keep going. Um, again, like yes, I love Suikoden too. I love. I like a lot of JRPGs. I just kind of never. I didn't have a PS1 at the time. I should have when I would have when Final Fantasy VII was big. Um, but I don't know. I, I respect for how much. I respect how much they changed it, but it just didn't. I don't even know if I want to go back. Um, yeah, uh, Marvel's Avengers. I played the campaign. Thought it was a fine I'm Marvel story. I'm not I don't. On it. I don't care about um, Marvel now that we're much. Just kicking rocks. I'm moving. I'm on. just mentioning stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. Um, when we're uh, at a Marvel Avengers, we're not actually talking about Honorable flight simulator. Yeah. You're just mentioning things. Flight simulator. It's impressive. Uh, gorgeous game. Okay. I'm going to my number one. <laughs> Hold on, wait, 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 wait. Should we all say wait, it at the you same better time? Fucking, it better be real honorable. That's what I'm going to say right now. Wait, should we all, yeah, let's all say our number we one should all, We time. should three, two, one, because we actually, this is for real, we have not talked about this ahead of time, but no. I'm kind of thinking we might say the same thing at the same time. You want to try it? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, but we're on. not, but go on. Okay. We're, we're going to do, it's going to go three, two, one, and then we say it, okay? Yeah. Okay, in that, in that pacing. Yes. Well, well oh, this is not the real one, but this is the example, so don't say it. Ready? It's going to go, okay. when we when we really do it, it's going to go three, two, one, 
game. Game. Okay. You ready? Sure. Number one game of 2020 thus far. Three, two, two one. one. Hades. Half-Life Alex. Oh, interesting. Okay. You got the first two letters, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. I, I'm not upset with Half-Life Alex. Wow. Um, I did. I thought, all right, threw me for a loop yeah. there. Well, Dan, because we I know you guys fucking love Hades, Hades and we're gonna we're gonna talk about how dope Hades is. And I actually didn't talk about Hades because I knew we were all gonna talk about how awesome Hades is. <laughs> I want to tell you again that Half Life Alex is one of the most inventive games of the last several years. When they make these games, they make them to do something different that other games aren't doing at the time that everyone will talk about years from now, and they did it again. Half Life Alex is ahead of its time. You guys need to at least get to the scene with Larry. And I very specifically say that because he's just an incredible character that is designed to upset you. He did what I wish Resident Evil 3 could have done. He did what no Resident Evil has ever done. He embodies fear incarnate. He is absolutely grotesquely horrifying. And it is a brilliant game design that's never been done before. Play Half-Life Alex. I rest my case. Okay, between yeah. that and, and what we said earlier about it, like, I feel like I, I basically saw the tutorial, and as someone who likes Half-Life a lot and wants a substantial VR experience, I feel like I just need to push forward more with that. So You maybe, have to hey, push forward more. You but know let's and, talk and about I, Hades. No, <laughs> yes. Mary, is it, would it have been in your top five if you didn't think we were going to talk about it? Or are you is is it just... I definitely would have put Hades in my top five. I think, like, Hades is better than Carry On. I, I, I allowed myself the room to talk about things that I felt were really valid to me because I knew Hades was going to be everyone's number one. It is dope. Let's discuss how amazing Hades is. It's very good. Well, so, Dan, we haven't even talked... You and I talk... I mean, all three of us, I guess, we talk fairly often about the games we're playing, but, Dan, you and I... We're talking about Spelunky, honestly, more than we've talked about Hades. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I don't remember the last time I thought about a game this much. Mm. It's and I, the amount of times it has done something or introduced something, and I've been like, that is the smartest thing. Like, especially in this genre, which I feel like I know it's not new, Rogue, you know, has been around whatever. But like in terms of like, you know, the post, like let's say Rogue Legacy. Spelunky, Binding of Isaac, and I know there's likes and lights and everything. I feel like this is the one I've played that most blew me away with the systems and the amount of things it introduces. And it's just like, oh my god. It is just hitting on every possible thing you this type of game could. Well, sorry, John Carson. I'm not... The Last of Us 2, I'm saying I th thought about that game in its wake after I played it. Hades, I think about while, like all the time while I'm playing it, to be clear. I'm not contradicting myself. I remember what I said, and I know what I'm saying. Hades, I actually like. Will like later in the day after I'm done playing it. And I don't. I don't like. I'm not when I'm not playing games. I often just will tune them out, kind of like, at the, especially in recent months. And I think about certain builds and how certain abilities will play together. But like honestly, I think to contextualize it, I don't put story ahead of gameplay ever. Almost, I. I think there are a lot of fantastic stories and games i think every year we get game uh, games that push narrative in this genre or in this medium forward however i don't i usually play a game for the gameplay and the design and not the narrative hades actually kind of did something and i play a lot of rogue lights mm -hmm. hades at a certain point when i realized i was really really just enamored with it i i had a choice between two rooms for those who haven't played it, you basically, each time you finish an encounter with enemies, you have, like, f anywhere between one and four doorways to go through, and they kind of show you what the reward will be, whether it's this currency or that currency or this power-up or that max life improvement. And at a certain point, I was like, I almost would always choose the power-up or whatever over some narrative thing. But I saw that it was the room into one specific character and the way that the game tells its story, which is honestly the most impressive thing that it does on, in, in a lot of ways, and it does a lot of impressive things. I actually picked the narrative choice over something that I was confident would have gotten me a better chance at beating the final boss, which was so 
against everything else I do in games where I'm always like, this story is not going to like really hit me that hard. And this might, this is probably an inconsequential thing. Like I just, I knew this character was in the next room, but I was like, oh shit. Like I just talked to this dude that she hasn't talked to in a while. That's back at the home base. Like it actually kind of, the narrative kind of fucked with me in a way that I was like, it did alter my decision-making, but it just does so many things flawlessly. Um, not to say it doesn't have problems here and there, but it is just mechanically so tight and fluid and feels so good. And it can change on a, on like at a, at a moment's notice, the way your build can change. If you pick yeah. a, like this certain Poseidon boon or whatever, um, it's great. Yeah. And it's, it's let's talk about different. like um, that type of mechanic where you're basically, so these roguelites where you die and you start again from scratch, but how do you make it a unique experience each time that makes it worth replaying again and again and again? Um, everyone several years ago, I want to say it was several years ago, I can't remember how many, but uh, everyone got like really into dead cells. And yeah. I felt like I was the only like, dingus that didn't get into dead cells not that it was bad i just didn't get sucked into it like everyone else did and i couldn't really put my fingies on it on why i just didn't care and i think a lot of it i think a lot of it actually was the fact that i didn't understand why i was dying and just coming back and being the same person all the time they were just like that's just the mechanic of the game whereas hades builds it into the world you are you are actually in hell and you're trying to escape hell. And if you can't, you go back to hell. It fucking makes sense. What's brilliant about this concept is they're not just saying like, oh yeah, when you die, you have to start from scratch. It's built into the world. They meticulously made it so that you actually, and as you are uncovering and, and giving yourself additional skills, it's all built into the world. They're not just telling you their mechanics. There's reason behind every little piece that they're doing, which gives you so much more value to it. But in addition, the other thing I felt like they really, I, they really didn't get in Dead Cells, but I felt like I was almost always taking the same path um, there were different options that I could use to kill people, but I got addicted to certain type of things and then I was never trying out anything. In this game, you're required to try out things that you couldn't because you only get two doors and if they didn't give you the door that you wanted, then that's just tough tits. You have to go down the path that they told you to. You pick mm -hmm. the, the lesser of two evils, quite literally because you're in hell and you're just kind of hoping that maybe you get a, uh, to go to a store so you can buy a little bit more life or perhaps a boon. Maybe that's a better choice. But even but if you get a boon, it's only going to give you three choices out of like 15 yeah. possible ones. You don't know what you're going to get. The, yeah. There's so much more gambling in this game. And so you cannot, you cannot make your path. You have to weave it. And this game is very, it's very brilliantly designed to make you try different ways to play. But, it, but there's also just, it balances that just enough with this agency where it's like, okay, I've got three critical, um, critical chance boons. I think I have a pretty good start to a crit build. And then the next three boons might not really build into that, but you can adapt. It's like, okay, my attack has um, two boons, one from Artemis and one from Poseidon that upgrade my critical chance. I just got one from Ares that's changing up how my special works. That wasn't really fitting into my initial plan, but I'm going to roll with it. And then by the end of the last boss, you realize, holy shit, that one Ares boon completely upended my understanding of that run. And it was even f more fun than I thought it would be. Well, or I, mean, I was, love if, that you can... I feel like there's not a lot of randomness in this. Where, like, there were times in Dead Cells where it's like, well, this is the drop I got. I guess I got to do this weapon that I don't really like. I feel like uh, Hades will encourage you to try different things where it's like oh you'll get plus 20 percent darkness if you use the bow even though you usually don't use the bow but then you can mm -hmm. kind of craft exactly the build you want and, and granted it's not like you get to pick from all the available boons every time but i feel like you can really take ownership over your build every run and it's like okay well it started me out with this poseidon thing so i've got some good like knockback so okay well now that i've got that i guess i could build on that and i feel like it's just less like rolling the dice and here's what you're given do the best you can with it i i always feel like i have some level of control over my build and then just the persistent stuff the, the rogue light elements like all the stuff you can get with like the darkness upgrades or buying like a new codec or even like cosmetic stuff back for your chambers i feel like every single time i die 
I'm just excited to like see what characters are there and then give the nectar gifts to people and see what I get from that and then see what I can afford in terms of like going to the mirror and getting new some uh, abilities there or maybe there's a story segment maybe there's like a cool flashback or something where I learned something about a relationship with your dad or whatever like it's I just love every second I'm playing this game. And I feel like I'm rarely trapped into like, oh man, I got screwed early on. This run is going to be a wash because I have to use this mm. thing that I don't like. I feel like everything is in flux and you have control over it and you're stronger every time in a smart way. Oh my God, it's so fucking good. It, it is the new gold standard for roguelites for me, 100%. Yeah, they did really perfect on that. And I appreciate what you're saying uh, when it comes to the fact that they are putting random elements into it. But because they've, they've balanced it so delicately, you never feel like you're out of control. You never feel like you're on a run you don't want to be on. I can't remember the last time I've played it and been like, I guess I'll just die and no. start again. You you have the ability to succeed to the end with any build. It's more about how you craft it and obviously about learning the mechanics, right? Like how do you take on each boss and how do you how do you learn from your mistakes of your past like any beautiful game does. When you die, you should never say that's some <coughs> shit. You always say, "Damn, I wish I I wish I did this one move differently. It's always on the player at the end of the day. Yeah, and, and it, Ver Verdant Tree mentions here that, like, every weapon is fantastic. And I feel that way, too, because, like, typically mm -hmm. I have a very strict play style. It's like, well, I, I want to have range and speed and stuff like that. And so when I saw the shield was there and I had enough keys to buy the shield weapon, I was like, I'm not going to like that. I don't want to do some defensive thing or whatever. Not for me. And I got the shield, and it's like, holy shit, like, my first run with it, I got a thing where you throw it, and it ricochets off, like, four different enemies, and then, like, the your basic attack is, like, basically a melee. Like, even the shield thing is super fun. I just unlocked the double fist thing. That seems awesome. Like, every single one of those weapons is so much fun. It, It's also, the game balance, it's got the pattern recognition in its bosses of, a, like, a Soulsborne. Like, the, the way that I... I look back on the day when I was having trouble with the Bone Hydra, and I'm like, how the fuck did I ever think that boss was hard? I absolutely... It balances... It is such a good roguelike in the sense that, yes, there is there are these permanent unlocks, and they are they definitely, they definitely help in terms of accessibility and ensuring that you see more of the game, which I think is a huge boon to it. Ha <laughs> ha! Boon! Um, I said boon. I didn't mean to. I should have said no pun intended. Don't, don't put farts on. Oh, farts, farts. Are they back on? Fart, just a quick fart. They're on? Just one quick. I just, just a quick fart. You're, you're done. They're done. Uh, okay. Um, I think it balances the way it's got. You look at Spelunky and it feels like they're polar opposites. Spelunky is just pure skill based. You are learning and you're improving your skill. And I think that, like, in a, in a roguelike, if you play it long enough, I'm sorry, in a roguelite to differentiate if you play it long enough you might not need to improve your skills because you're getting so many upgrades yep. like in dead cells or rogue legacy rogue legacy one and i love two in early access right now but rogue legacy one was one of my favorite games of the year it came out it's in 14 or 15 14 i believe but it's that actually kind of uh is it kind of hides how much skill you just happen to accrue in hades without realizing it because you're so focused on all these currencies and upgrading and getting your darkness upgrades in the mirror and getting new weapons and upgrading the weapons and trying out new boons that you don't even realize you are getting really fucking good at this game yeah even if you turn off the darkness upgrades you're like oh shit i'm destroying this boss and i i, I learned this boss without realizing it because everything else about the game fed into that and then because i got so skillful at the game i don't have to worry as much about this boss's pattern so I can experiment with new builds, which the game is built, which the game is built to encourage. It just all these. It is such a web like of seemingly kind of contradictory parts that just happen to actually help each other out. That it's just mm -hmm. it's just so you don't really realize how complex the game is because it just feels so good to play. It is just mechanically, mechanically just like gold, and it doesn't feel as if. There are a lot of complex things happening under the surface, but there are. And the item management and figuring out which currency to build up, like, okay, do I... It's not a matter of, like, do I think this this run is just, like, shit? Do I think that I should just give up on this run and just focus on getting keys or darkness or gems? Or do I think I have a legitimate shot at the boss? It's more about, okay, for this next three rooms, I could try to get um, keys because I want to unlock these next two darkness mirror upgrades. But then I'm going to have a little bit harder time against the Hydra. 
Then I get to Elysium where they, there's a pretty steep difficulty spike. But I really need to... The, the thought process that you're doing while also just kind of being in the moment in each of these encounters, because the encounters are rapid fire. I think the longest one is usually like three minutes. They're not long. They could feel long, especially like in Elysium, but they're not long. I mentioned this. ages. Yeah, I mentioned this on Twitter. It's like, it is just, it feels like they, Supergiant in this game especially, understands the modern attention span. You are you are just doing these rapid fire battles and getting these upgrades, constant upgrades and changing up how you, your understanding of your present situation at like every left turn. And it's just, it is just the, this Hades reminds me of why I love video games Yeah. in just the purest sense. And I can't, I can't stop thinking about it. And I'm not even touching on how they tell that story. I, I I just tweeted this because I didn't want to say it here and then go pretend it was an original thought. I actually, people have been saying for years that um, someone should take the cute, the carry the torch of Shadow of Mordor. I understand they're fundamentally different games, and I understand that the, that Shadow of Mordor's nemesis system works on a much more uh, intricate level in terms of the technology. Hades, the number of situations that Greg Kasavin and his team have taken into account is so impressive. It does not, it is just this mat, it's just massive illusion, this magic trick that they, they have accounted for everything. And it makes you feel like I, I tweeted the other day and it like, people were astonished. Like Meg, when I first beat her or yeah, when I first beat her, she's like, no, this doesn't count. You have all these cheats from this mirror that Nyx gave you. So I'm like, oh, that's funny. She knows I'm using these. So just out of curiosity, on my next run, I spent the one key to reset them. You can respec, but I didn't put any. I didn't put any. I didn't upgrade anything, and I went and beat her without it. And she acknowledged it. She's like, "I guess I don't have an excuse. Wow. You didn't use the mirror, so what the whatever. Get the fuck out of here. It hurts my pride more than anything. But you gotta leave." I was like, "Holy shit!" They recognized that. Like they knew that that dialogue she did when I beat her would lead me to maybe try this. That's awesome. And I'm sick. They didn't put that in the uh, early access either. It's interesting because this game yeah. came out in early access and all those dialogue options were not there. In fact, there were characters that were completely redesigned from early access to final. And when you see those changes that they made, you can see why they put all that extra effort before the game was actually released to put in those minute details like what you just said, Mike. And that's why yeah. I'm so glad that I didn't play it until now. Is because I know there's got to be a certain joy in, like, you know, picking it up in early access and seeing all the big additions and stuff like that. But honestly, like, like Dead Cells is a good example. I beat it, and then they put it, I guess there's a bunch of new Dead Cells stuff. Same with, like, Bloodstained, games that I beat, and they add a bunch. It's like, once I beat it, I typically don't really go back. So, like, I'm so glad that instead of for a couple years, you know, following every update, that all of a sudden I'm, like, handed this game that is just fully fleshed out and complete and just all of a sudden just, like, diving into it. I feel like there's just so much there. And uh, also, I want to mention, I'm playing on Switch, and that is a hell of a Switch game. Me and Bianca are both playing on that. Um, There there are a couple times where the frame rate will get a little droppy, but never to a point where it feels like it's impacting the gameplay. looks great and portable. We're both playing it so much, like, we are both having dreams about this game. It yeah. is, uh, oh my god, we're just oh, yeah. fully, fully wrapped up. I'll wake up in the morning and be half awake, and I'll, I'll be thinking about some new boon last night that I never paid. Oh, that happens all the time. It's like, it's like I'm, I'm, I get the boon, I get Artemis' boon, I'm like, how the fuck could that ability ever be that useful? But then the next time I go through, I'm like, I have this build, and it's like, oh my god. There's one that it does damage based on 5% of your total wealth. Oh. And I'm like, but I'm always spending money. Why would I ever use that? But I got that early in the game. And then I got Hermes Boon, which gives Good you 10 choice. coins every time you go into a room. So then basically, every time, I wouldn't spend any money. So by the time I got to the final boss, I had, two, I had like 2,200 coins. So in addition to all my other boons, I was doing just, what's 5% of that? Like, oh shit, I shouldn't have. Do the math yourself, but it's a lot of extra damage. I fucking destroyed the last boss. And I didn't, because I didn't want to spend, the, and that that brought up the whole risk reward of shit. Do I want to spend this money on this? Like, I do need health, and I need. I think I'm going to need all three of these death defiances against the final boss, but I also want this five percent to make more of a difference. Um, it's just, it's. 
It's fantastic, but also like as when you're talking about dead spells, dead cells versus this, this makes you such a better. Use, I know this makes That's such true. a better use of space. Dead cells, mm -hmm. obviously, it's 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 not just two D versus isometric kind of two point five whatever three D. It's dead cells is like such close quarters and confined and like on like one level, whereas Hades so much about movement. If you stay still in Hades, odds are you're gonna get fucked up. And my favorite ability in the game is Poseidon's Tidal Dash, which, again, I didn't think anything of at first. But now, if I get it, I can't not... The only time I haven't gotten it is when I saw a Fated Choice, one of the prophecies, you know what I'm talking about, yeah, that would yeah. give you a big currency boost. Oh, my God, the fucking knockback on it, the damage it does, and if you keep upgrading it and... Is that where you dash and then the wave kind of, like, goes out from underneath yeah. you? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And it's like, you, it's like, it's water. It's not going to do much damage, but you can make it do so much damage and the knockback and hitting him against a wall. And if you do it to their back, it does even more damage unless you have the other. It's just. What's your favorite weapon choice to go through the game? Spear. Spear and a bunch of hangover boons. Hangover's good. I think Dionysus is my favorite character. Uh, is that, he, that's the hangover dude, he's right? The, he's the god of wine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's great. He goes, yeah, yeah. I like the shield, I think. I think I'm enjoying just a, a big, chunky front attack with the defense um, on my heavy. is like, really valuable to me. Uh, I like... Uh, my favorite is the twin fists. I did not think so. The first time I use them, it's the attack, I don't use much, but it's special. You can upgrade it in such a way that it's, like... Uh, there's a... Do you guys... So, do you know how roughly how many runs in you are? 20 no. 25 maybe okay. if you get that like pool in your uh chambers you can look in it and it'll tell you stats yeah do you do you know if i said the term weapon aspect would you know what that means because i don't want to spoil uh, anything no but i heard about that because i I looked up what titan blood does and i had to, ah, okay. I, you have no, to have all the weapons yeah. unlocked before that's even a thing so i have not yeah, yeah. Yet. I, I didn't really appreciate the twin fist until i got the um the magnetic cutter upgrade when you do you know what the twin fist special is it's the jumping uppercut he does yeah, yeah. So sure you, you can, can get it so that will attract it will magnetize people and i was like okay that's cool but then you start getting you get ones where it's like oh it does hangover and it does knockback but then your cast can also chill people if you shoot it in short range so i'll suck them in punch them chill them and then dash back out um cast again, hit them, and then jump back in and magnetize them. It's just the, everything, it, it feels like they considered everything. I'll suck them in, punch them, chill them, suck them in again, stab them, and then win. And that's the strategy. <laughs> Never <laughs> doubt like, it, kid. You're going to go you, far. Are we talking about XCOM again? <laughs> this is the strategy of the ages. I think, I think generally. Cover me. I'm going to suck him off. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to. Does somebody have Overwatch? Because I'm ready to fucking punch his. I'm going to punch him, and I'm going to suck him. Cover me. <laughs> Do we have a sniper watching over us? Because I'm going to suck that dude. What is this character? Cover me. <laughs> yeah, which Overwatch character is this? It's my favorite. No, not Overwatch. XCOM. Oh. <laughs> Somebody, use your, use your ultimate. I'm going to suck it. <laughs> That's my I'm hungover, and he's chilled. I'm going to fucking punch him. Somebody suck me. Somebody I'm just turning suck into me. the mask impressions here. Somebody suck me. I'm hungover and I'm chilled and I'm deflecting these attacks into their back into them. I gotta uppercut them. I gotta punch them. I'm gonna punch them. I'm gonna fucking who has a spear? So that who has lightning? Well, who has going up? <laughs> who has lightning? Think... Imagine co-op right. in this game. Oh my fuck. <laughs> man i think there's definitely so much to say about this game which is why it was easy to get to the number one because there's so much to say about how amazing it is um generally speaking when you think of 2020 would you say that this is kind of a a, a thick fog of a year of games or would you say it's a little thin and we were kind of like looking for games to fill out our top five thin 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 yeah i agree I I always think a year's thin. Like I thought that last year, and then I got to make a list. I was like, ah, oh, shit. I actually think there's a. I don't know. I think I just enjoyed video games in general more this year. Like a lot of people, I think I relied on them a little more. Um, but man, I I I think Hades would still be toward the top of my list oh, any year. Um, yeah, 
Hades is not a uh, oh for a thin year. It's a it's a good number one. It is a thin year, but Hades is a game that would hang near the top of the list in any year. And it's again to like speak about the story and like the conditionals that they wrote for. Um, I'm 67 runs in. I checked earlier today, and I have heard. There's one specific tiny instance where I've heard a repeated line of dialogue. Um, there's a specific fight where there's, uh, you have one person cheering for Zagreus over your enemy. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's, kinda, it's like a nice little detail. And I've heard Zagreus say the same thing to him twice in 67 like runs. Regardless of the story, the fact that you've played that many runs and haven't heard the same line says something about that game. Oh, it it's just crazy. says that they've thought that much about the replayability, so there's always something to uncover. There's more story, there's more unlockables, there's more character builds, there's more secrets to unlock, and that's kind of what makes this game so deep and so worth exploring. Um, and that's why it's number one. Two out of three agree. I would, I, Cyberpunk or. Baldur's Gate more for me, or I, I, Assassin's Creed Valhalla could very well be a game I love. Uh, I love Assassin's Creed. Uh, there's probably a few I'm missing through for the rest of the year. Something's going to be have to be really good to make Hades not my game of 2020. Yeah, I think that's awesome. We'll have to see like yeah where these uncover. Dan, like, do you think you'll have any major changes out of the rest of 2020? We're already at October. I mean, I'm trying to think of the big ones. Like, is Ratchet and Clank a launch game? I don't know. I expect to like that game a lot, but I mean, even like a really good Ratchet and Clank game, I don't think I would. I think it's I not Hades. What Miles Morales is? Yeah, uh, that's... Demon Souls is the right. remake. I'm, I'm excited, excited to play for... those, but like, yeah. I, don't, I don't. Cyberpunk is maybe the only one that I could see, you know, making a real dent on this list. I mean, and there there could be any number of games that aren't on my radar right now that surprise me. So. Uh, certainly... Proto Corgi. What's that? Uh, Proto Corgi. You're a, a, a Corgi in space. It's a shmup. Is that this year? Yeah. I have not heard of that. I like shmups. Well, you're a you're a Corgi in space, and you're shooting things out of your Corgi face. Okay. <clears throat> um, it's on my radar now. Everyone, pay attention. <laughs> I can, I kind of lost track of time. We've been here for like three and a half three hours. A half do hours. we wanna? Do we wanna? Take take at the end to talk about what we think the game of the generation is. I could mention mine for sure, and I, I feel like I've talked at great length about it before, so I can I can get it on the record again. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I my favorite and what I think represent the generation are two different things, which I can get into, but we don't have to stay here too long because I know we've been here a while. But um, uh, yeah, I don't know, Mary, do you have something in mind? Yeah, uh, Hollow Knight is the greatest game of the last 10 years, for sure. I'm not kidding. Uh, it's incredibly inventive. The world building is unparalleled. It's just a shame that Dan is so blind to have not seen it. Um, much like his Half-Life Alex impression, he could only get through the <laughs> tutorial before realizing he perhaps did not have the skills to play I played a lot of that game! I played a lot of Hollow Knight before I dropped off. But did you play it well, Dan? I love that genre. I love hard entries in that genre. Genre. The map situation was unforgivable to me. I the idea of like walking through an area, doing a bunch of shit, and then dying, and then being like, "Well, okay, I guess I gotta just blindly walk around through this again." I don't think the art style or character design did much for me. Uh, it. Uh, so you hate Dark Souls? Not at all. I like, and I understand that going in back Dark to your Souls, body. You can go stuff. down an area of a map and find out that it's too difficult for you and you waste a bunch of time and then realize you went the wrong direction. I feel like with the Dark Souls, with like a 3D game, I feel like there's so many more landmarks and ways that I, I can kind of remember where I'm going or whatever, where with Hollow Knight, I would go super deep into an area and not get the map thing or whatever. And then I would die and I would see where my stuff was. And it's like, man, I don't want to go halfway. I, I don't want to spend, you know, 20 minutes trying to go down this area here only to find out it's, it's a dead end and I can't see the map. I don't even know how to get down there if I wanted to. Uh, I just found it frustrating. I, uh, I, I remember, Mary, when uh, I met up with you at Twitch 
when you were at the the height of uh, playing Hollow Knight for the first time and loving it, and you were raving in a way I still to date have never seen you rave about a game. And I remember I had just started it, I think, and I wasn't liking it, and so I was kind of biting my tongue a little bit because it's like ah, I'm not going to speak up here because. She's obviously played the shit out of this, and I am just starting, so I don't really know what to say about it. Now that I played much past that time, I just I don't get it. I, I do not get the Hollow Knight thing. And I love the genre. Love the genre. We're on the same page with Ori and everything. But uh, Hollow Knight, it's uh, not a great one to me. It doesn't hold your hand. You're like specifically telling a story about how you never acquired the map and you went so deep in this area that by the time you were killed, you were punished for it. But the most that you would have lost in that situation is souls um, or like not the same currency in that game, but essentially like the spirits and you can just acquire those again at a later time. I remember giving the game to a friend of mine who wanted to try it and died twice and lost my currency. It was a gut punch, but you can rebuild. It's interesting that these situations to you were so, um, so damning that you were like, I lost $200, so I'm not playing you anymore, game. No, no, Whereas, no, 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 like, no. the point of it is to, to explore and die and then see if that maybe wasn't the right direction to take at all. I didn't say. It had nothing to do with the currency thing. It had nothing to do with losing my stuff. It is because the act of getting back to it, Geo. I did not find fun. And so if I found it fun, I would have all the patience in the world. Whereas, like, look at something like, like a Bloodstained. It's a Metroidvania where... The act of doing everything in that game, especially later on when I was trying to get the platinum and everything, it's so fun just darting around, just doing all sorts of weird, wacky stuff in that game that I was just grinding for hours and hours and hours every night, just trying to make every recipe and, and do everything because it was so fun to just be in that world and run around. Hollow Knight, I felt like it was How is Hollow Knight not fun, Dan? You don't think running around slicing bugs in their hearts isn't fun? You fucking played a game where you were a shark for yeah, like 30 that was fun. hours. That was fun. So it's just fun. I play games for fun. I know people play games for different reasons and everything. And, that's, and that's crazy. All I play games to waste my life. Hollow Knight is super fun. It has everything that you could possibly need. It has the aesthetics. You like you like orally good games. <laughs> Have you ever been in the dirt, Dan? They made actual worlds underground. There's an entire area filled with bees, Dan underground you and you have to hear them to be able to get into the area say have you ever been in the dirt have you <laughs> i feel He's like she's about to put me dirt. into it you dirt get person in the dirt. <laughs> she'll put you in the dirt if you don't like that game soon uh, it's a solid seven out the of the bees ten. dan the bees it's a solid hey, well spelunky has that? bees spelunky's you say, better did you say it's a solid seven out of ten yeah it's a good it's a good little game it's it's well made there's a talent Talented people work on that, I'm sure. Thanks for joining us today. If you guys want to find out more about Breath what the our Wild. top five lists are. Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild is the best game of all time. All time? Yeah. Yes. That's ballsy. It's true. Uh, yeah. Look, I, it's, it's just the science. I would, I I'm would not say... going down these rabbit holes. If we want to have another conversation of the best game of all time, that's an entirely different session. Well, I'm saying it, 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 it is, by extension, the best game of the generation. I'm just going one level above that and saying it's just straight up the best video game of all time. Yeah, I think it was my it's my game of the generation as well. Like it's tough. It's one of those things where I want to do the loophole where it's like I absolutely think Breath of the Wild is the best game of all time, but just because I want to talk about it, Bloodborne is my game of the generation. That's a good it idea. Doesn't make sense. Sense. Um <laughs> <laughs> nah. All right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Bloodborne is my favorite game of the generation. Um, but Breath of the Wild is, I think, is the the winner. Um, XCOM 2. I'm just listing games. I think Breath of the Wild is a game. You're literally game. just listing games. Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild. Well, just for that, Hollow Knight fucking sucks. <laughs> All right. No, I love Hollow Knight. Fucking stupid list. <laughs> Guys, don't even... You haven't even played it. You fucking play all these baby ass games, these candy ass boys all the time. <laughs> Zelda, best game ever. Zelda, best game ever. Zelda. Yeah. I really, I you know this is gonna shock all of you guys. I think Zelda's the best game. Yeah. Okay. So we're all on the same the page. Credits. We're on the same page. 
Okay, like, oh, I really pushing the pushing the limits of game design here. Uh, we'll, we'll print out uh, a little uh, emblem. Uh, Fire Escape sorry. says that Zelda is the best game ever. We'll put it on Nintendo's booth at E3 next time. Sorry they didn't make Zelda while listening to goth rock jazz and graffitiing <laughs> the walls of their studio and drinking absinthe the whole time and smoking the reefer. Oh, Zelda's so corporate. I fucking hate it. Neo is more... I don't know. I just saw Neo on the screen. <laughs> I like Hollow Knight a lot. Don't you guys think that Zelda's a little too gauche? I don't Zelda, even know what that means. Zelda's fucking. <laughs> Zelda's... That's how I beat you, Dan. I just use different words. I'm not competing in that arena. <laughs> this is how I win. Uh, um. Well, this has been productive. Yeah. If yeah. you guys want to ever do this again, I'd be down. I think we could definitely have another conversation like this eventually oh, yeah. where we talk we about We should reconvene like our... in January. Uh, yes. Let's do our finite games. Uh, we'll call it the PERMA official finite list of 2020. This and was then the we'll bury in. it in a time capsule and never unbury it because 2020 was the worst. <laughs> this was the mid-year in almost October check-in. <laughs> yeah, we the original like idea came up i think well the original idea was like a patreon but <laughs> we, we were talking about doing this in like july halfway through the is that halfway through june sorry we were talking about doing this in june and then we were talking about well july because we are busy or whatever was going on i i we were all working quite a lot over the summer um and then we were like okay well now the consoles are like a month away um Star Wars Squadrons comes out Friday. Who knows if that would have made our list. I'm excited to try it out. Um, I will be streaming that. Baldur's Gate 3 is early access. I, what is it? It's like any day now. I forgot the day. It's soon. Um, regardless. Uh, yeah, this was super fun. Well, I'm, I want to do it again. Yeah, very, very fun. Uh, yeah, I love that we're all in spots where we can do this. We, uh, we we're all weirdly like technically out of games media but we're still i feel like we're not out of of games you know we, perhaps we've all got we our... can tinker with that concept these are people who have dabbled on the edge of games media we are on the cusp we yeah. are uh what's that thing called when you try and get a basket but the a basketball hits a rim the shot rim? Yeah. you're thinking of a rim job I'm thinking of Rim Job Games. That's what we are. Okay, rimjobgames.com. Rim Check job the pod, URL. Podcast. Okay, rim, the Rim Jobbers. Yeah. All right. Rim if Job I... Games Podcast. All right, yeah. Oh, that's the one. We uh, can workshop it. Let you sleep on it. Okay. Sleep on it. Don't say no. <laughs> I dabbled in Rim Jobs for a while. All right. It's been a delight, you guys. Yes. I'm going to get dinner. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna, you can't uh, control this stream. This stream goes until Dan says it stops. I can close oh, it I'm here. hosting. Oh, she's hell? gone. Oh, she's gone. What right. is this? <laughs> this is a nice piece of art. All right. Oh, I like to drink beers. Rock flag and eagle. I have a French bulldog. What is this? Is that it's a Mary impression? Yeah, that's Mary. Oh, okay. oh shotgun of beer. Oh. <laughs> Oh, if your if your drink doesn't have yeast and hops in it, it's not a fucking drink. What oh, is this bullshit? It's made from grapes. Fuck it. Ah. Oh. <laughs> you're making fun of her for shotgunning a beer when you're literally the person who taught me how to shotgun a beer. What is that? Is that a cat? That's not an animal. Get a French bulldog. Ah. Also, he's drinking a beer right now, and I'm drinking a vodka soda. <laughs> you're owning your own friend. You're all over the place, Mike. <laughs> you're a loose cannon. I just wanted to remind you guys who. Um, Who's the cool one here? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you're the only one without a green screen, so uh, you know. I know. Step and things up. Yeah, put him somewhere else, Dan. Punish him. Okay, we can just like this there we go. Fun. He's going to his home planet. There we this go. This is my, This has been fun. It has been. No. Yeah, send him off Stop. into the sky, please. No. No. <laughs> no. 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 Uh oh. <laughs> This sucks. Oh, this is. This isn't what I wanted. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm gonna hit the end button. That's it. That's our games of the year. Bye, oh, I just got I just got so lightheaded. My face.